many people these days are complaining that they can't focus. They're mm. struggling with their memory. They they just can't pay attention yeah. in a way that they used to. So in your view, what's going on? Yeah. I mean, the world is, has changed, certainly. Uh, technology, and I'm pretty pro-technology. It also, it, it maybe hasn't caused it, but it certainly has amplified some of that distraction, that digital distraction. I mean, we live in an age of rings and pings and dings and app notifications, social media alerts, and uh, so I feel like in a way that we're driven to be distracted and how do you maintain your concentration, which is so important nowadays. You know, we live in the attention economy. And, um, you know, but we're rewiring our brains to, to react uh, and to be able to, to focus uh, every little thing that's, that's in our purview. And so, um, and how are you going to get things done? How are you going to learn? How are you going to study? How are you going to be productive? Um, you know, in, the book, in my book, Limitless, I talk about four uh, digital, um, it's like the four horsemen, if you will, of the mental apocalypse. And I, I tend to alliterate, so I made them all Ds. Uh, the first one actually is digital distraction. You know, is uh, is you know, with uh, with the rise of technology and every like and share and comment and cat video, and then we get those dopamine hits for kind of rewired to be distracted. Another one that's that we're facing that people I think are are struggling with right now is this thing called digital deluge. It feel like uh, there's too much information, but not mm-hmm. enough time to go through it all. It feels some people describe it as taking a sip of water out of a fire hose, maybe, or they're drowning in information. And how do you catch up and keep up and get ahead? And some of the things we could talk about here is I talk about accelerated learning, which I think is one of the most important skills to be able to uh, to master in the 21st century, to be able to to be able to uh, to catch up and and really really thrive. Um, excel, uh, accelerated learning could also imp- uh, be uh, speed reading. You know, where yeah. you could, you know, you have so much to read. You know this, you know, in, in, in your field, and the amount, the half life of information is getting shorter and shorter. But the amount of information is coming at dizzying speed. But how we read it or learn it, that growing gap creates uh, information anxiety, higher blood pressure, compression of leisure time, more sleeplessness. So it could be a big, big challenge for people. Um, and then there's one that that I I, I term digital deduction. Digital <laughs> deduction. Yeah, that's keep, the third one, right? Yeah, digital deduction. Um, so you you have you have digital uh, distraction and digital deluge. Digital deduction is this phenomenon where we it seems like this generation is not having the same uh, ability to to think or to rationalize. You, you have applied logic, critical thinking, and um, you know it could be. S- because of technology, you know, with algorithms, a lot of technology is doing the thinking for us, right? It's telling us, uh, you know, giving us our recommendation, it's telling us how to get from here to there. If you think about, you know, way back before GPS, you know, we would have to build visual spatial intelligence in order for able to get from here to there. But now we rely on our devices, so we don't mm-hmm. have to think through outsourcing that. And then a big one is digital dementia. I mean, think about that. We're, we're so reliant on technology to also be like our external memory uh, drive. I mean, think about how many phone numbers, you, you know, your audience, you and I used to know growing up. I mean, a lot, right? A lot, yeah. yeah. And how many do we know today, current numbers? You know, probably could count on one hand, maybe one, two or three. And not that I want to memorize 500 phone numbers, uh, but it should be concerning that a lot of people complain about not being able to memorize one, you know, yeah. a phone number or a PIN number or a passcode or a seed phrase or what they ate that day or a conversation they just had. I believe two of the most costly words sometimes in our life, certainly in our work, are I forgot. I forgot to do it. I forgot to bring it. I forgot that meeting. I forgot that conversation. I forgot what I was going to say. I forgot that person's name. You know, every single time we have those lapses, we could lose time and credibility. Uh, we could hurt a relationship. Those are two powerful words, aren't they? I forgot. It's interesting because it's clearly something that is increasing in society. People in their 30s now are saying, you know, I just can't remember that. I can't remember where I put my keys, mm. right? So, Or something larger like their car. Or, or hey, something you, larger like their car. You see the people walking around the lot with their, with their car alarms like GPS trying to figure out where yeah. they park their car. So I, I want to sort of explore what's going on here. You've mentioned these four Ds, right? Yeah. And of course, they all start with digital. Yeah. And you also mentioned that you're pro-technology, right? So it's not necessarily technology that's doing it. Maybe it's the way we're using that technology sometimes that's problematic. So 
you know, let, let's let's go through those yeah. one by one. I know you've outlined them, yeah. but digital distraction. I think we all kind of get that, that we can't focus because we're just drawn to our smartphone and we're just, before we know it, we should be doing a work project, mm. but somehow we've ended up down a Twitter rabbit hole or, right. or we've been on Instagram for 10 minutes without even realizing it. Yeah. So what can we do about that? Yeah, I mean, for me, technology is not necessarily good or bad. It's exactly what you said. It's how it's applied. Like fire is a form of technology and fire could cook our food or it could burn down our home, right? But you're right. It's how it's, it's how we're using it and as opposed to it using us, right? Technology is a tool for us to use. But if the if technology is using us, then who becomes the tool? Then then we mm -hmm. become the tool, right? And so, you know, having agency, I think is very important, the, the, a way of starting this conversation in terms of that we're not a, a victim, that we always are the pilot, we're the pilot of our lives uh, instead of the passenger. We're the pilot of our minds. We're not the passenger. We don't have to just be reacting to it. You know, my, my challenge is when people pick up the phone out of boredom, right? I mean, you know, in terms of how many, how many times are people opening up social media or touching their phone or if it's at the table during a meal, you know, it creates that kind of unconscious anxiety that's there. It's just the impulse to be able to pick it up. And, uh, and so part of it is obviously controlling the, the environmental aspect of it and knowing that we always have a choice, right? There's, there's a quote in Limitless from a, a French philosopher and he says, life is the letter C between the letters B and D. Life is C between B and D. B is birth, D is death, life C, choice. Mm. You know, we always have that choice uh, every single day. We are, our lives in effect is uh, the sum total of all the choices we made up to this point. You know, where are we going to live? Who are we going to spend time with? What are we going to eat? Uh, what are we going to do for a living? Uh, what are we going to yeah. feed our mind? And, uh, you know, I'm also thinking that when it comes to choices when, and the decisions that we make, I believe that even at a, at a meta level that these difficult times, they could distract us. We're talking about distraction. It could diminish us or these difficult times can actually develop us. We, we always decide because we always have choice. Every day we wake up with, with a chance because we have choice right? And, uh, and to take responsibility of it as opposed to putting it out there like something, you know, I, I always use this metaphor that it's important for all of us to identify more with a thermostat than we do a thermometer. Meaning a thermometer, let's say a thermometer is in your room, what's its function? It just reacts to the environment. Whatever the <laughs> environment gives it, it reacts. And as human beings, we are sometimes like that. We react to how people treat us. We, we mm -hmm. can react to the weather. We can react to... Uh, uh, the economy, uh, you know, all these different things. But ultimately, you know, you know this, you know, as you write about happiness, the, 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 the people that are most fulfilled, happy, successful, they tend to not react as much, right? They tend to maintain more of their agency. A thermostat has that agency. A thermostat doesn't react to its environment. A thermostat, it knows the temperature, it, it gauges, mm -hmm. um, it has awareness uh, and though it sets a temperature and what happens to the environment, the environment reacts to it, Yeah, right? No, I, I love that. And, you know, w when I've watched your videos online or listened to your podcast, I see a lot of shared philosophy. I yeah, see a yeah, lot of yeah. things between us that we both like to talk about. And I know first thing in the morning is a very important time for you as it is for me. Yeah. I really do passionately believe that the way we start the day determines so much of what happens later on in that day. You know, mm. if you start off consuming news, don't be surprised that you feel anxious, a bit frazzled, a bit negative about the world yeah. later on, because the way we feel is often downstream from what we're consuming. Yeah. And I know you're big on morning routines. You're big on not looking at your phone for yeah. a period of time in the morning. And if we use the analogy of the thermostat, I guess we get a chance every morning to set the thermostat on our life, yeah, depending exactly. on what we do, right? So you're a brain coach. Mm. You're a world-renowned brain coach. So to you what does an ideal morning look like yeah. if we're thinking about the health of our brains? And, our, and specifically towards things like focus, yeah. have better focus throughout the day. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm very intentional. And, and when, when I go through some of the things I talk about in my morning routine, I'm not suggesting it's for everybody. I don't think necessarily everything is for everybody or everybody's for everything. You know, I, I do 
ask people to maybe experiment. I think ultimately we are our best coach and uh, it's nice to have mentors and, and, and others and get their feedback, but uh, to test it on themselves. And then, you know, you know, everyone's situation is a little bit different, right? Some people work at night, you know, they're night workers, they have lots of kids and, and such. Uh, for, for me, when I wake up, my, my goal is, you know, while I do some of the biohacking people see on, on social media, you know, the, 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 the cryotherapy and the, the saunas and all that, most of that I like to get nowadays from nature because it's free. Um, I feel like it's, it's, it's very natural. Uh, it's very duplicatable, you know, for all of us. Um, is that when you spoke about recently, um, you'd like to get the four elements yeah, first thing in the morning? Yeah, I, I, I do. I do. That yeah, was beautiful. It, it, yeah. Can you, could you elaborate you know, on that? I was, when I was um, researching uh, another book, I was, I was reading about the elements and how, you know, uh, ancient cultures like from, from Babylon and, and Babylonian times, they used to believe in, in ancient Greeks, they used to believe everything was made up of these four elements, yeah. air, fire, water, and earth. And I thought, wow, that's, that's, that, that's very beautiful. It sounds very natural and organic for me. And so for me, I like to infuse my day with those elements, you know, maybe first thing in the morning, and you could do it by going out and getting grounded. You know, I, I love taking off my shoes and, you know, being barefoot. You're you know, barefoot now in the yeah, studio, yeah, as yeah, exactly. I am. Yeah, and walking around your beautiful yard and it's very peaceful. You get grounded and, you know, some people use biohacking like PMF mats, you know, at certain frequencies. But, you know, I feel like that all of those and are meant to kind of imitate nature, like the infrared, you know, the red lights is to imitate the, the sun and so on. So I'm going out there, I'm getting the, the direct sunlight, which is very important. You know, we, we know uh, many people talk about getting uh, direct sunlight first thing in the morning to reset your circadian rhythm, to help you sleep better at night. So that's the fire for me and I have the earth. Uh, I hydrate uh, because we could lose a good amount of water through when we sleep, through respiration yeah. and perspiration. and. You know, uh, just staying hydrated could boost your reaction time, your thinking speed upwards of, of 30%. I mean, it's a huge, not not a small boost, but a huge lift. So how much do you drink each morning? Yeah, for, for me, it's a little different. Um, each, I always go by like how I feel. And, you know, also that's dictated by the night before, just like uh, getting good night's sleep is dictated by how you start the day also as, as well. I do some electrolytes. That, that really works well for me, the, the salts and, and the minerals. Uh, you know, a, a nice tall glass works yeah. for me usually room temperature it just kind of like that's my personal thing and then um and then the last one is air and that's just doing some breathing exercises yeah. you know sometimes people feel sedated or they when they're reading they fall asleep or uh, they feel like they have that that mental fatigue and i feel like a lot of times it's just because we're not getting enough air i mean sometimes we have to just even check our posture when we're at our desk because sometimes when you collapse your diaphragm the lower one third of your lungs could absorb two thirds of the oxygen so you know it's really important to get that blood flow and that oxygen to to where it really matters so those are the kind of things i do but intentionally what i'm thinking about in the morning is I do this, and I've done this for the longest time. I do these thought experiments, you know, where I'm, I, I just I'm gonna imagine myself at the end of the day. I could do this in bed, or I could do this outside. I can imagine a family member asking at the end of the day, "How was your day?" And I was like, "Today was really great. You know, I'm very blessed. You know, I crushed it today. Something like that." And then I ask myself, if that's what I say, then what had to happen in order for me to feel that way? And I work backwards. I kind of reverse engineer it, meaning like I think about three things personally and three things maybe uh, professionally that happened. And they don't have to be huge, big things, but that's where I kind of put my focus and my intention. I kind of work backwards. I was like, okay, if I do this, you know, if I have this this conversation with you, you know, that that's a that's a big check mark for me, and that'll make me happy. You know, if I walk the dogs, you know, or play with my son, or I do these, you know, do specific activities, that that's a win. So I work backwards from that. Yeah, you mentioned before about being the pilot. Yeah, right, rather than a passenger. And I really like that practice where, yeah, you've mentioned the four elements, mm -hmm. completely get that, can see how that will be a very, well, literally a way to ground at the start of the day, root yourself, give yourself the kind of core ingredients that yeah. a healthy human needs each morning, right? Yeah. But I really like that exercise where you fast forward to the end of the day and almost yeah. visualize saying to yourself, that was a great day. Yeah. And so what do I need to do to make that a great day? I think that's a really nice practice. And can you give an example maybe, or, or how does this change things? Because, you know, does it automatically 
change the way you approach the day? Are you thinking about things you have to have done? Or are you also thinking about things like, you know, when I see my work colleagues, I want to be yeah. calm. I want to be present. I don't want to be snapping at anyone. I want yeah. to, you know, what what sorts of things are you thinking about? Actions, behaviors, bit of both. Yeah, yeah. And I've, I've done both and or created a composite. I think to-do lists, most people listening have some form of to-do list way of tracking the tasks that they have to check off. Um, I think it's important to also have a, a to-be list. It kind of maybe sounds a little little corny, uh, but a to-be list, it's, you know, the whole idea where we're not human doings, we're human beings. But, you know, when we're faced with a decision or a dilemma, you know, often people are like, what do I need to do? And I think if people took a step back and say, who do I need to be at this moment? It changes, you know, the, the reference point, meaning that, um, maybe I want, like maybe you're in a spirited debate with someone at work, and you say, like, "Who you know? Who do I want to be? Maybe I want to be compassionate, right? Or I want to be loving." And then the behaviors take care of themselves. I don't have to think about what I need to do if I'm focusing on who I need to be at that moment. Right. So this is really about a proactive approach to life rather than a reactive one. Yeah, I very much think like a, one of the syntaxes or strategies of success is you you know the be do have share that kind of model. You know, because it's a lot of people want to jump to the have. They want to have a perfect body. They want to have, you know, lots of money or or whatever, right? Or even when people win the the their their lottery, right? And you know, all the stats when people have and what happens over the next X amount of years, they lose all of that and more, right? Mm. The, those jackpot winners because they jump to the maybe you do have they jump to the have point, but they were never being a millionaire. So they weren't doing the things that, you know, wealthy people would do to have the things that they would have, right? So I think all behavior is belief driven, meaning that if uh, at events when people see me do these demonstrations where I'll memorize, uh, you know, a room full of people's names or whatever, I always tell people I don't do this to impress you, I do this more to express to you what's possible because the truth is every single person listening to this, regardless of your age, your background, your career, education level, your financial situation, your gender, your history, your IQ, we could all do this. We just weren't taught, right, how to learn. There was no class called memory. Um, you know, as so Socrates said, learning is is remembering. So part of it is knowing that you could have the skills, the, the knowledge, the abilities through training, right? Because you know, school taught us what to learn, but not necessarily how to learn those those specific subjects. And I think that's important. But um, but also when we're going from be, do, have, share, people at these events, they'll come to me and they're like, Jim, I'm so glad you're here. I know you're you're a memory coach. I, I have a horrible memory or our senior moments are coming too early or I'm just not smart enough, right? And then I'll say, stop. If you fight for your limitations, you get to keep them. If you fight for your limits, they're yours, right? And um, and so I really feel like you know everything starts at that being level. That it's part of success is aligning three H's: your head, your heart, and your hands. Meaning there's an integration and alignment of what you what you think and believe, what you feel, and what you're doing. Meaning some people could have goals in their head and they, they have a standard in their head, but if they're not acting with their hands consistently. Maybe they have a goal for health or impact or income, but if they're not doing the actions with their hands, I think it's really important to check in with the second H, which is our, our heart, right? Which symbolizes functions of, of emotions. Because we are not logical, we are more biological. When you think about dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, mm -hmm. endorphins, we're this neurochemical feeling soup, right? And uh, when we're coming, I, even building on that, yes, maybe you want to have a, instead of just a to-do list, maybe you want to add three things you want to be and also three things you want to feel that day. Because here's here's the first principle that I teach with accelerated learning is that you don't, it's, it's about taking nouns and turning them into verbs, getting in the habit of taking the nouns in your life and turning them into verbs. So what? here's an example. I, I think the nature of what we do, you, you and I and others, it's about uh, transcending. It's about ending the trance. This mass hypnosis, whether it's through marketing or media or from our parents or from wherever those thoughts kind of mm -hmm. came from, you know, and those impressions, those expectations that somehow told us we were broken, that we're not enough, right? Um, and so how do you trans... Part of the and if it's not external, some of that hypnosis is not just coming from marketing or media or fear-based thing. It's coming from ourselves. It's yeah. like internal, 
you know, belief and internal doubt and even our internal self-talk. So if you say something like, I don't have motivation or I don't have energy or I don't have focus, I don't think these are things you have necessarily. I think they are more things you do. So you're taking, when you have something, it's a noun, but when you do it, it's a verb. So you don't have energy, you do it. There's a process for generating energy. You don't have focus. There's a process for harnessing your focus and concentration. You don't even have a memory, right? There's a, there's a, there's a process of encoding and storing and retrieving, you know, those memories, you know, you don't have motivation. There's a process for motivating yourself also as well. Mm -hmm. So the reason I bring this up is, you know, before we go into all the tactics and the tips for focusing and reading and memory and so on, is this is idea of this, having this mindset where it's, it's your, uh, where, where again, coming back to personal responsibility, personal ownership, mm-hmm. where you're relentless about your own agency. And, uh, and that gives you, when you turn something into a process, then to a verb that gives you your, your control back, right? Yeah. You're not putting it out there saying, I, I wake up and I, I, I hope I'm, I have creativity so I could write today, or I hope I have energy so I could mm-hmm. be with my kids. You, you don't have to hope, you could actually do real help because hope is not a strategy and say, okay, how can I generate energy? How can I create these memories? How can I, uh, how can I what's the process for motivating myself? I love the idea that behavior is belief driven. Mm. It, it, it really sort of resonates deeply with me. Uh, and I just want to share with you well, some of the things I've learned yeah. over my years of clinical practice. Um, I used to think, and I, I believe this is one of your seven lies of learning, that knowledge is power. And I want mm-hmm. to talk about that in a minute. And, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, I've always been very passionate about the power of lifestyle to prevent, reverse, and also treat most of the things that I see. Always been passionate about that. And what I would often see, Jim, is that some people, you know, you'd spend time with them, you try and educate them on the changes that you think if they make them, it's going to help them feel better, help their brain function, help their heart's health, help their energy, their focus, whatever it might be. And yeah, some people would make changes for a few weeks, a few months, you know, they'd change their diet, they'd go to bed a bit earlier, they'd have, you know, a 30 minute walk every lunchtime, Mm. and they would feel different. I thought, okay, great, this is awesome. And then not all of them, but, you know, a significant percentage a few months later, or when they come back to see me six months later, they've kind of slip back yeah. to their old selves. And I, I used to sit for a long time pondering this, going, what's going on? It's not knowledge is information. Knowledge is power because they've got the knowledge. Not only do they have the knowledge cognitively in their brain, mm-hmm. they've also got the experience. They've applied it and felt better. Mm-hmm. So why is it that they're flipping back? Yeah. And I believe it's a huge part of it is to do what you just mentioned, which is behavior is belief driven. Yeah. I think it's to do with compassion. You know, if you fundamentally don't like who you are or you have a problematic relationship with yourself, at some point you often will slip back into those negative behaviors yeah. because they they align with what you actually think about yourself. You know, you're worthless. You're not, you know, you, you, there's not, you know, you're not worth achieving or whatever it might be, you're not worthy, mm-hmm. right? So before you know it, your behaviors start to align with those internal beliefs. And I observed who are the people who, truly transform their lives for good. And it's usually when they've changed their internal programming, the voice in their heads. You know, a person who truly loves themselves, who truly cares about themselves, actually looks after themselves pretty well because that's what someone who loves themselves would do. They would look after their body. And even in my own life, I would say, I used to be very regimented. I used to be very regimented about routine. Mm. You know, I, you know, my classic case was New Year's Day. You know, I'd be like, right, this year I'm going to yeah. nail meditation. Right, that's it. And I would be great mm-hmm. for two weeks or three weeks. You know, I'd do my 15, 20 minutes a day and I feel I was rocking the year. And then, you know, you miss a day because you're a bit busy. Right. And then that one day becomes two days. And then before you know it, it's something you used to do. Right. And I over the past years have really worked on the internal dialogue and, you know, my childhood and all those kind of things. And as yeah. you change your beliefs and your values, I actually find behaviors very easy to stick to now. Like I'm not as regimented 
as I used yeah. to be. There's a mixture, there, there's a kind of balance between discipline and compassion now. Yeah. Whereas before it was kind of like this hard coach to myself. Th- does that resonate at all? It, it does. I, I think there's a, there's a, you know, there's this pendulum that swings that it could be, it's paradoxical, but it could be true that, you know, things could be, you could, you could, you could, you could uh, force something and then also things could be in, in flow, right? That you could, uh, you know, you could strive and then you could surrender, right? It's this kind of uh, balance between hard and soft, yin and yang. I, I would say when it comes to mindset, so you are, it's been my experience, right? I'm doing, this is, I'm starting my 32nd year of, of as a brain coach that our brains are like this incredible supercomputer and our self-talk and our beliefs are the programs it will run. So if you tell yourself things like, I'm not good at remembering people's names, you probably won't remember the name of the next person you meet because you program your supercomputer not to. If people truly understood how powerful their minds are, they probably wouldn't say or think something they didn't want to be true. And that's not to say you have one negative thought and it ruins your life any more than eating just one some of that candy or that donut will ruin your life. But if you did it consistently every single yeah. day, multiple times a day, it will it will show up in your life. And so for me, you know, when we're thinking about planning our day, it's not so much about uh, time management. I'm thinking about more mind management. I'm trying to think about priority management. For me, it's about you know, controlling the controllables, right? And it's about the most important thing is to keep the most important things, the most important things. And for me, the most important thing is the three things are the three things that I control. And we could turn this into a masterclass. If, if somebody feels, so Limitless, which is the title of my book, it's not about being perfect. Limitless is about advancing and progressing beyond what you currently believe is possible for yourself or what you're demonstrating for yourself. So the opposite of that will be not advancing. It would be being stuck. So if your listeners or your viewers, if they think about it, listen, let's get very, very uh, engaged here. Think about an area of your life where you feel stuck. Okay, I'm, I'm talking to the listeners right now. Like, th- take a moment. Is it your health? Are you not advancing in your health, your impact, your your income, your wealth? You know, your level of happiness. Where do you feel like you're not growing and you feel you can't, kind of feel uh, stagnant and stuck and contained? Maybe it's your reading speed. You feel like you're a very slow learner or 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 a bad memory. Where do you feel like you're trapped in a box? Now, by definition, that box, uh, that cube, is three dimensional, right? And so there's three forces that contain that box. And these are the same three forces that will liberate you out of that box. So when I'm coaching a client, what I'm listening for as I'm going through like this intake and this discovery is, is where, which dimension is keeping them stuck? Where's the bottleneck? So if you think about a Venn diagram, like three intersecting circles, like maybe Mickey Mouse, two ears that are intersecting and a face, there, these are the three forces the dimensions, if you will, that keep you stuck and will make you limitless. And the, I'll tell you that I'll give you the ending, you know, of the story. The face, the end one, it, they're three M's. Those are the methods. So you've mentioned that, you know, you you uh, as a medical professional, you know, doing the work that you do, you, people know what to do, but they don't do what they know, right? Because common sense is not common practice. Yeah. Well, I mean, how many times do we need to hear about the benefits of, of cold therapy, you know, saunas, you know, breathing, you know, meditation, you know, reading and exercising and, you know, zone two, like we, we, we hear the same things. So those are the methods and the methods could be upgraded over time as we learn more and more and, we, and, and research is done and we, we, we get the, that feedback. But a lot of people don't know what to do, but they don't do what they know because you're right, knowledge is not power. It's potential power. It becomes power when we apply it. So what keeps people? So if the last M is the methods, what's keeping people from doing what they should do consistently? Because that's the only evidence that people are, are you know, are they're you know, committed is that they consistently act. So the first circle, the first M is your mindset. Mm-hmm. Now you've had many experts on the, you know on your show talking about the power of mindset. You know we had you know this this conversation about all behaviors belief driven, right? That your brain is like a supercomputer. Self talk is the program it will run. You know, and so that that's in mindset. Mindset for me, functionally, how I'm looking at it, I have defined mindset as a set of assumptions and attitudes you have about something. Mm-hmm. So what's your assumptions and attitudes about money? What are your assumptions and attitudes about health? What's your attitudes, assumptions about love or relationships, 
right? Because let's say, you know, your attitudes, assumptions about like memory is just like, hey, you know, it's hard. Like my, I grew up with a traumatic brain injury. When I was five years old, I had an accident because I was, I had very slow processing. I had poor focus, a poor memory. I struggled every single day. It mm -hmm. took me three years longer to learn how to read. You know, I was being teased. I think people hear, you know, when I was nine years old, I was being teased in class because I was slowing the class down. A teacher came to my defense and pointed to me and said, leave that kid alone. That's the boy with the broken brain. Right. And that, and that, that, that affected my mindset because before that you could pretty much say I was more of a blank slate, right? That was, that was, I wasn't born with this idea. I was broken, but every single time, you know, I uh, wasn't picked in class for, you know, for sports or I did badly in school, I, which was often, I would say, oh, cause I have the broken brain mm -hmm. and that, be, that label became my limit. Right. And so adults have to be very careful with their external words because they often become a child's internal words. Right. And so while, oh, yeah. yeah. And so while, you know, we, while we are a product of our history, you know, the expectations of others, you know, our experience, our external environment, um, you know, family and everything, we and we alone are 100% responsible for our lives. And that's something I just choose. You know, I have these primary beliefs that I am responsible for my life, good, bad, or indifferent for everything. Cause that, cause wherever, you know, whatever you feel, cause if I put the blame outside, that's where my, that's, I'm just giving up my power my sovereignty to something else, right? To, to my, to the, my boss, you know, to investor, to, to the environment. And I don't want to do that because then the benefit of having responsibility is that it gives you the power to make things better. Like I got to, um, I got to go to dinner. I spent a lot of time with uh, Stan Lee you know, the creator of all these superheroes and superheroes is a big part of my mythos. I even, uh, you know, Limitless, even as you open it up, it has the the structure and the stages of a hero's journey, Joseph Campbell's work. Yeah. And, um, and Stan, uh, Stan wanted to meet Richard Branson and Richard Branson wanted to meet Stan. So I'm picking up to go to dinner and Stan's in the car. And I just, I was like, I, can I ask him, is it appropriate? I was like, okay, I'm going to do it because I need to know this because I'm just very curious. It's like Stan. And the reason why I love comic books is they changed my life. I mentioned I couldn't read for three years after my brain injury, like all the other kids. But I taught myself how to read by reading comic books and something about the illustrations and it brought the words to life. And so I'm very connected to this, uh, this hero's journey. Because uh, for me, a superhero is somebody, they're not perfect, right? They're flawed, they have challenges, but you know, they offer people hope. Yeah. And they offer people real help, right? And then that's something we all could do, you know, in our life. We could offer people hope and, and real help. And one person can make a difference. These overarching themes that good will will, will eventually overcome evil. And uh, so I, I was like, Stan, who's your, your favorite, you know, superhero? I, that's the question I have. And he was like, Jim, it's uh, my favorite is Iron Man. And he said, uh, you know, he, he, he said, who's your favorite? He flipped it on me. Who's your favorite superhero? And Stan had this uh, big Iron uh, Spider-Man tie. And uh, I was like, Spider-Man. And when I said Spider-Man to Stan in his iconic voice, he said, with great power comes great responsibility, right? Something we've all heard. And truth be told, I, I reverse things when I hear it sometimes or when I read it. And maybe because I had, a, you know, some head trauma as a child um, and I heard something different. I was like, you're right. With great power comes great responsibility, Stan. And the opposite is also true. With great responsibility comes great power. Yeah. When we take responsibility for something, we have great power to make things better. Yeah, I, I love that, Jim. So what would you say to someone who says, okay, I get that. We've got 100% responsibility yeah. for our lives, but you don't get my life. Right? Mm -hmm. I've had a a tough start. Um, I grew up in poverty. Yeah. You know, I'm an immigrant in a different country mm -hmm. and I've got all kinds of struggles and discrimination to face. Mm -hmm. You're saying I've got 100% responsibility for my life, but yeah. I disagree. What would you say to that person? Yeah. I would say whatever script people have, that I would say if you're, you're probably right, first of all. Um, you're, you're right that these are all the situations that, that are there. And, and I would say... In as kindly as I could say it, and I would say, and what what changes? Because it, for me, beliefs are something that's not necessarily true or false. For me, a belief is 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 this useful, 
or not? Is it yeah. useful for me to, to believe that? And I would ask that person the same, is that, is it useful for you to, because because I also have a belief that if somebody had hardship or they didn't have the connections or they didn't have this and they still succeeded and we all know in culture, there are many examples, mm-hmm. you know, then, then, what, then what happened there, right? Like, you know, my parents immigrated, you know, to, to the US. My dad lost his parents when he was 13, didn't speak the language, lived in the back of a laundromat that my, my mom worked at you know, had no money, had no connections or anything. And then so if everybody has, and I, you know, my brain and everything, everyone has a, a story. That then the thing is that story could keep us in that mindset as stuck, like we're a victim. And my challenge is that all all the excuses that, and we all could justify yeah. where we are and, and nothing changes. I mean, we're like fighting for our limitations. It's like, this is all the reasons why I can't be happy. These are all the reasons why I can't be healthy. These are all the reasons why I can't make money or, or whatever, right? Or I can't learn or I can't read or anything. And for me, life switched when I started, because I used to say like, well, you know, why do I have this broken brain? You know, why me? Why me? And, and literally, you know, I'm activating my reticular activating system and I'm shining a spotlight on these answers. And I didn't like the answers I was getting. <laughs> Right, because it, they weren't useful. I couldn't do anything with that. But when you had the belief, mm-hmm. you could find evidence everywhere to support that belief. Like you could have a negative belief and go, "Yeah, this is why I've got a broken brain. This is why I've got mm-hmm. a broken brain." Right. So you oh, reinforce absolutely. the narrative. Oh, a- absolutely. And then, so as I, I, you know, I talk about in the book this dominant question idea, where we have sixty thousand thoughts on average a day. The challenge is ninety-five percent of those thoughts are the same thoughts we had yesterday. And the day before that, and the day before that, you know, and those thoughts, you know, lead to lead to uh, feelings. Those feelings lead to actions. Those actions lead to experience. Experience go back to you know modeling our thoughts, right? And it becomes this loop. And so, if you're having the same ninety five percent thoughts, feelings, everything, then how are you going to affect real change, right? You know, in yourself or or somebody else. And so, my my thing is, I got frustrated. My inspiration was my desperation. I was going through so much pain, so much suffering, so much bullying, not feeling enough, doubting myself all the the time. And then I started changing the questions. It's like, instead of like, why is this happening to me? Then I started saying, you know, well, I'm broken. How do I fix this? I was like, okay. So I said, that gives me a little bit higher quality answers because I start shining. I start activating that reticular activating system, that RAS, because primarily our brain is a deletion device. We're trying to keep information out, right? If we let everything in, we yeah. would go, we would go mad, right? We'd be so overwhelmed. You know, so where do we shine the spotlight of our attention? And usually, you know, like for example, we're hardwired to to respond to our name, right? If if you're out and about in any city and somebody shouts your name, you're gonna look regardless, because it's your heart nervous system is hardwired, your RAS is hardwired to do that. We're also hardwired to look for things that are important to us, the things that we value, the things that are survival, the things that we ask questions about obsessively. And so I started asking, how do I fix this? And I said, How do I make this better? Then I was like, then I started getting answers. I was like, okay. And then with those answers, I started behaving differently and starting to get different kind of results. And that reinforced, you know. So I think we all have this kind of momentum. And, you know, because everyone wants m- m- momentum, but some people have momentum yeah. in a direction they don't want to go, you know, also as well. I mean, I think it's really powerful hearing that, you know, this idea that we have 100% responsibility to make sure you're taking action after watching this video. I've created a free guide to help you build healthy habits. We can all make short-term change, but can those changes become a fundamental part of our life? Often they don't. And that's why in this free guide, I share with you the six crucial steps you need to take. They're really, really effective. If you want to get hold of that free guide right now, all you have to do is click the link in the description box below. As you say, you can be dealt a bad hand in life, right? For sure. Yeah. But if you don't believe you have agency to change, it's just not that useful. It's like, yeah, Yeah. we can, you can have self-pity, you can tell the story. And again, I get it. Mm -hmm. Many people have had... And my heart goes out to people who are suffering and struggling. But it was really interesting for me. uh, What one of, well, there's two now, but one of the conversations on this podcast that has changed me the most was the conversation I had with a lady called Edith Eager a few years ago. At the time she was 93 and she was in Auschwitz concentration camp Mm. when she was 16. Her parents were murdered within a couple of hours of getting there. But there was something about her that was just so, it was just so inspiring. Like she was full of forgiveness. 
compassion, empathy. And she said things to me like when I was in Auschwitz, I didn't see myself as a prisoner. The prison guards were prisoners. They weren't free in their minds. Yeah. I was. She said to me, I never forgot the last thing my mum said to me, which was, Edith, nobody could ever take from you what you put inside your own mind. Mm. Right? And I never forgot the last thing she said to me, which was, Dr. Chatterjee, I have lived in Auschwitz and I can tell you the greatest prison you will ever live inside is the prison you create inside your own mind. Mm. I fundamentally am not the same person after that conversation as I was before it. Because if, if I'm ever having a struggle in my life and it, something seems insurmountable and I'm tempted to play any form of victim narrative in my head about, yeah. oh, poor me, blah de blah de blah I think, hey, wrong. You know, in Auschwitz, Edith could reframe, yeah, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. If she can do it in that yeah. hell, you can probably do it here. Yeah. Right, so I found that very inspiring. And literally yeah. two weeks ago, I spoke to, uh, there's a book that's just come out called My uh, My Friend Anne Frank. So Anne mm -hmm. Frank's best friend, Hannah Pick Goslar. It, it's one of the most gorgeous books I've read. I say gorgeous, it's tragic at the same time, but yeah. Anne's best friend of moving away from Germany, coming to Amsterdam, um, the war's closing in, the Nazis coming in, her ending up at the age of 13 in a concentration camp for two years, yeah. and then... You know, she's liberated. She died a few months ago, uh, just before her 94th birthday. But literally in that chair two weeks ago was her daughter wow. and her co-writer of her book. And again, I was asking them, I said, what is it? What was your mum like? You mm. know, one, at that trauma as a child, she said to me, Ruthie said to me, she could deal with anything, anything. She was a doer. If there was a problem, if things were going well, she'd always... Very much like you're saying, yeah. there was a hundred percent responsibility. So I feel we can learn when you see people in those extremes, mm -hmm. right? It, it's not about making ourselves feel bad and go, our, our pain is nothing compared to theirs. It's more for me. It's more about wow. If they can, if they can learn these lessons yeah. there, I can learn them here. Yeah. Those two stories gave me uh, goosebumps. Yeah, I don't know. The camera showed it like when 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 you were telling it with Edith and. I call them truth bumps because there, there's something that's that's a, a fundamental truth there. You know, I, I had um, 20 years ago plus, I was giving a, a presentation at a conference in upstate New York and uh, like three or four hours north of New York City. And one of the other speakers, her name was uh, Immaculate. She told the story, uh, she's from Rwanda and she was there during the genocide and she hid in a bathroom with uh, seven or eight other women and stayed there. I'm, I get choked up thinking about this. Stayed in there uh, to survive for 91 days in the bathroom with seven or eight women, a, a small bathroom um, hiding there while, you know, her. But the, the most horrific things happened mm -hmm. to, to the people in her life. And when she came out of that, she found out that her entire family was was murdered, and you know, and it's interesting because when I met her, I, I just like I I hugged her and I just cried, and and I offered her a, she was going to fly back to New York City and I offer a ride, you know, because I I driven there, and I she went into detail about what she went through, and I pulled over three times because I just couldn't deal with like yeah. the details, um, you know, so I was just bawling the entire time and. It's interesting though because she came out of it though the, the the you know has some of the most she's like one of the most forgiving peaceful people that I know and you know she wrote a book called Left to Tell and uh, and, and it's her story going through uh, you know and it's it's, it's all, and all the great stories you know that we when we talk about the hero's journey, it's going from limited to limitless, right? Going yeah. going from, you know, like come somewhere where people are stuck or they're trapped to a point where there's some kind of change inside and they're they're liberated and they get a level of freedom, right? And and I feel like um it's so profound. And I use that also as a lesson when I see people, 
you know, going through situations and they come through it and they, they're authentically, genuinely, you know, better off than a lot of people who haven't gone through a fraction of what they've gone yeah. through. And I, and I too, do believe that, again, that with struggles comes strength. We hear a lot about uh, post-traumatic stress and I'm not minimizing that at all. That's that's a very real thing. You know, I get a lot of people coming to us that want to learn how to read faster, but their nervous system is really locked up, you know, and they're in their, they're trapped in their survivor brain and it's holding them hostage of their creative executive functioning and everything. And there's also something that I just want to shine a spotlight to whoever's, you know, this might be useful for. We hear about a lot about post-traumatic stress. We don't hear a lot about post-traumatic growth. You know, this phenomenon where people have gone through adversity that they wouldn't wish upon anybody, right? But they also authentically wouldn't change what they went through because there was some kind of gift yeah. through there. They, they, they found a mission, they found a strength, they found a character trait, you know, they, they, found, they found something, a purpose going through it. You know, for me, my challenge was learning every single day, not feeling good enough every single day, being bullied for my, you know, for being different um, and having this kind of quote unquote disability, you know, and life has a sense of humor. And because of it, I also, my, my superpower was shrinking. Like I would, I would sit behind the tall kid because I never had the answer, right? I, I would get sick if I had to give a book report, right? I would, have, I would avoid the spotlight because I didn't want to be seen. I didn't want to be heard. Why did you call that your superpower? Because I was really good at avoiding getting attention, meaning that, you know, when they passed around the book to, to, to you to read out loud, <laughs> you know, I, I, when it got to me, I wouldn't understand any of those words. I would pass it on. That was so painful for me. I never wanted to feel that spotlight. I think a lot of public speaking, the fear of public speaking came from those reading circles because nobody's good at reading the first time. And that's what we learned. And so fear is learned outside of, you know, a couple of innate, you know, uh, you know, fear based things in our nervous system as human beings. But a lot of that fear is learned. And I talk about it in the book about the lies you mentioned that we tell ourselves. Lie for me, everything's an acronym stands for limited idea entertained. It's not true that you're not enough. It's just a limited idea we're entertaining at that time, right? Mm -hmm. And going back to the beliefs, I like to choose beliefs that are useful to me because I ask, is this useful or not useful? Because the truth is, again, all the excuses we make for our lives, it could be absolutely accurate and nothing changes because excuses are in effect useless. You know, when, when we complain about something and we put it outside of ourselves, nothing is different. We waste a lot of time, we waste a lot of energy, we, we waste a lot of focus, you know, even by doing that. And we honestly, okay, I'm like the coaching part of me is coming out. We, we can't be upset by the results we didn't get from the work we didn't do. You know, and so much, so many of us have to do more of that deep work you know, in, in certain areas. And so, you know, even online, you know, the, I'll give you a fifth one, just to have this conversation with you that for the fifth horseman, not only is digital deluge and digital distraction and digital, a lot of the one was digital dementia, you know, and digital deduction, there's digital depression, right? People are, you know, not feeling enough and they're going through and, and comparing themselves to the highlight reel of everything. And I just want to remind everybody on social media that it, the grass is greener where we water it. And sometimes the grass is greener on social media because the filter the person is using, right? Or there's, and there's a whole lot of artificial turf, you know, in social media land also as well, you know. So if we if we compare ourselves to other people, we're always going to be green with envy, and it, and then that's that's a challenge because we feel less than, right? Yeah. In comparison, and so I just want to bring to light, you know, there these are challenges, and it's you know we know that mental health, you know, uh, challenges is a is a real. Uh, loneliness, uh, you know, depression, you know, it's, there's an algorithm when it comes to media and social media, it's kind of like there's an algorithm to our mind. Like the algorithm is whatever you engage with, you get more of. You watch all the cat videos and like share them and everything, comment, you're going to get, your newsfeed is going to be full of cats, yeah. right? And your minds are the same way. If you're just watching the news and everything that's dark and threatening and scary, right? You, whatever you engage with, you're going to get more of. So you're just going to start your RAS, your reticular activating system, your nervous system is just trained to look at what's threatening. And pe chronic stress will shrink the human brain. Chronic fear will actually suppress your immune system, yeah. right? Chronic fear is a whole area of science called psychoneuroimmunology. It just makes you more susceptible to colds, the flus, the, to viruses, right? So we have to stand guard to our mind in terms of what we're letting in. 
Going back to the conversation about mindset, though, you know, and personal responsibility that, you know, with great responsibility comes great power. I start there because I think there's three big things in, in mindset. So if mindset is your set of assumptions and attitudes you have about something. Your attitudes and assumptions about your problems. Because often people think they're problems and we're addicted to our problems, right? And we start justifying, you know, this is the reason why. And we use them as kind of, uh, you know, evidence of why we can't be any way, any way else. You know, um, and so if we start focusing on the problem, I had uh, Quincy Jones in our audience. We do an annual brain power conference. The music producer. Yeah, yeah. He did Michael like, Jackson. All and that. Yeah, amazing. We, we are the world. And he was in the audience. I was like, okay, this is, I, I have to invite him on stage. Ashton, so you didn't know you were just doing an event and you saw him. Yeah, he, he, he was there. I mean, we, we're, 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 we're longtime friends and, you know, we would we collaborate on some some stuff and he was there as, as a guest, but I, I, I pulled him on stage and, I, and we started having to go into this conversation. Um, this was in, uh, you know, quite a few years ago. And I was like, okay, I want to, and he has, he could speak all these languages and, and, and part of it is you were talking about music and languages and, and everything. But then I was like, okay, everybody knows your successes, right? You listed some of them. Um, I want to know, like, tell me about your problems. Tell me about your struggles. You know, what, what you know, what, what are some of the things that, that you went through and are currently going through? And he looked at me, he said, Jim, I don't have any problems. I'm like, you're 80 something years old. Like how you, like, we all have problems. He's like, no, I don't have any problems. I have puzzles. And I was like, wow, that's a mindset, right? That is a mindset. A puzzle, like think about a problem is just like, ooh, I don't want to deal with that. But a puzzle is like a game. It, there, there's a solution, you know, to it. It's like a riddle and something that you could have fun with. And I was like, wow, that that's like a, his one of his, that's part of his mindset. The set of assumptions and attitudes about problems, right? Well, I don't have problems. I have puzzles. And so that's a, like, like a small example of, of this shift. Do you know if he um, has always had that or is this something he has cultivated intentionally throughout yeah. his life. Like maybe the younger Quincy used to have disempowering yeah. sort of narratives and problems and he figured out after a while, hey, if I keep repeating that, that's yeah. who I become. Whereas if I call these things puzzles, yeah. but it totally changes everything. My downstream thoughts mm -hmm. about that puzzle are completely yeah. different than my downstream thoughts when I call it a problem. Yeah, I don't know the specific incident, you know, he didn't know either in terms of when that, that when that, when that happened, you know, but it's definitely one of those lead dominoes, right? Yeah. Because that informs so much downstream, you know, as you mentioned. And he has this, this way of, uh, we, we're, he says you have to go to know, you know, one of the reasons why he thinks it's important to travel, even in your own country or in your different neighborhoods is because you get to experience, you know, some, there's different words, there's different foods, there's different language and different music, and it changes your perspective. And I think a, ch a point of view, changing your point of view, who you spend time with or the people place will give you a different way of looking at a problem because often the problem is not the problem, right? When we say we have these problems or, or all these situations, often the problem is not the problem, often the problem are our set of assumptions and attitudes about that problem. You know yeah. what I mean? The problem is not often the problem. The problem is more attitudes about the problem that kind of keep us in that box. So I'm just think, always thinking about mindset. And the three things I would think about mindset for everybody is not just your attitudes and assumptions about money. Because if your attitudes and assumptions about money is money is the root of all evil, or you know you don't get rich if you're hurting people, whatever, that you won't use the methods, right? That keeps people inconsistent. Because that's why people self-sabotage is because of mindset. They take one step forward and two steps back, right? They buy your one of your five best-selling books, right? And it just sits on their shelf, unread, and becomes shelf-help, not self-help, right? Because their mindset is, it's just like, oh, their mindset is, oh, if I have the book, then my life is better. And that's absolutely not true, right? And even if you read the book and then apply it, your life is no better than somebody who is illiterate, right? So the mindset's a little bit different. Um, I would also say that in this mindset, it's not just your set of assumptions about health and relationships and love that will keep you from doing the methods. That they're, they're your, your attitude assumptions about yourself. So there are three things that I would focus on in mindset. Number one, what I believe is possible. Because if you don't believe it's possible, you're not going to do it, right? And that's the other second thing is what I believe I'm capable of. Because you could believe it's possible for someone else to heal, or ha someone else to have a great relationship or someone else to be happy or someone else to read three times faster and understand what they read, but you might not believe it's possible for yourself, right? So what I believe is possible, what I believe I'm capable of, and then the third one, what I believe I deserve, right? Because that's kind of a thermoset setting that, we, you know, if you feel like we don't deserve 
that income or deserve you know, that relationship or deserve you know that level of intelligence, that impact, whatever, then we're always going to be mitigated in that box because that, that dimension is holding strong. So that's mindset. And the last one is methods. And the last part of it, the third dimension or the second dimension here that starts with M is motivation. So you're only going to be stuck in that box if you have the right methods to get out of that box, if you have the right mindset that allows that box to expand. And, and the, if you have the motivation to even struggle, get out of that box, right? To be able to practice and play at the edge of what you perceive are your limits. And I believe that motivation is, is a very straightforward thing for me in order to motivate yourself or to motivate someone else. Uh, your kids, your your team, right? Or someone to buy your product or someone to invest. There are three factors. The formula is three parts to get limitless motivation. And limitless motivation is just P, the letter P times E times S3. P times E times S3. So really, let's just use an example. Let's say, you know, you listen to one of our podcasts and you hear all these experts talk about uh, exercising and it's good for your brain, right? As your body moves, your brain grooves, you create brain derived neurotropic factors. And, but you're not exercising, you're not moving daily, right? Um, because maybe you have a limitless mindset, but you're not because the first part is P is purpose. A lot of people, they think purpose is something cognitive. I'm pointing to my head, but really I think it's more the heart. It's a feeling. It's something, it's something that you feel, you feel purpose. And if you don't have a reason, you won't get the result. Even when people forget people's names, right? Mm -hmm. So if I ask an audience of a thousand people, I say, who's has trouble remembering names? 95%, 99% of people raise their hand, right? If they're honest. And then I said, okay, what if we gave you a, a suitcase full of millions of wealth, right? Currency. <laughs> If you just remember the name of the next stranger you meet outside, who's going to remember that name now? And then those same people raise their hand, right? And then so as a coach, I'm saying, okay, how would you all become memory experts all of a sudden, right? You just said you couldn't do this and now you can do this. So I'm calling you on your BS, your belief systems, right? <laughs> it's not true that you can't remember names. You're just not motivated, right? right. Because we don't remember all names, but we don't forget all names either. Right. And I would say that genius leaves clues that when something's working, there's something there that's either visible or invisible to us, conscious or unconscious, that we're not connecting with. Meaning that you would tend to remember the names of people that could be good for your business. They could be a whale of a client, a great mm. person for your podcast, uh, someone you're attracted to, right? There's some kind of reason to remember their name. And with the reason, you'll get the result. So even if you wanted to hack that, when next time you're at an event or a wedding or something, you want to remember names, just ask yourself, you know, when you're meeting someone, why do I want to remember this person's name? Maybe the person, maybe to show the person respect, maybe to get a referral, maybe to make a sale, maybe to practice these things that I learned, you know, from this, from this podcast. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you can't come up with the reason, you won't get the reward. Right. So that, that's the power of purpose. Meaning so some of the time people will come to you and because obviously people come to you, they want to read faster. They want to you know, remember things, they want to remember names. A speech, right. A facts, figures, form, they're in medical school. But you're saying, are, are people trying to jump the gun? Are they trying to get to just, the method. Jim, give me the, give me the method, give me the hack, tell me how to learn. But you're like, no, no, back up a minute. Let's go upstream. What's your reason? Yeah. Without the reason, forget it. And, that, and that's the thing because and I truly, and I get, again, I've got goosebumps. You zoom in here, like, and they're truth bumps because I get so passionate about this. I feel like if you're listeners, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but I expect that you listening to this right now, you probably have forgotten more about health and personal growth and, and, and self-actualization and anything that you've heard on this podcast more than most people will learn most, more than most of your family and friends have learned. You're like, you're, 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 you're probably, your friends are probably asking you, why are you listening to another podcast, watching this, another YouTube, right? You know, and, and it's hard to change people. Like just think about how hard it is to change ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. And, and I would say also, how much are you putting that into play? Because common sense is not common practice, right? My book, Limitless, when I was first submitting it to my publisher, it was all methodology. And then before I hit send on, you know, in the email, I was like, will 100% of the people who read this book get the results they're hoping for? And I was like, there's just no way. Because a lot of people know what to do, but they don't do what they know. So what's missing? 
mindset, mindset. and motivation. Yeah. Right. So that's why I spend most time because honestly, a lot of the techniques, 95% we have courses and everything else, a whole academy, students in 195 nations that go through this and like speed read and improve their memory and focus and everything. But 95% we publish is, is free. You know, YouTube is free, podcast is free and people could, but the, so the, the things to do is always there, right? But <laughs> do you have the mentality to do it and do you have the motivation? So the first thing is purpose. And I'll, I'll give you the, the, a hard illustration that I had recently. I was um, going out and about and I saw someone I thought I recognized. You ever see that? You're like, do I know that person? And I was like, when I got, I was like, they called me my name. I was like, oh, that's the person. But I didn't recognize them. It's not that I have a great memory. They look totally different because the backstory is this person was very, very unhealthy when I knew this person. Mm-hmm. I mean, ex- extremely unhealthy or very overweight and lethargic. And the friends, we were just like, not a, he's not a close friend, but we would just kind of coach him. Just like, oh, you know, why don't you stop smoking that and doing this and drinking that and, and trying this, you know? And he would just know, he would take pride in being unhealthy, right? And I see him years later and I don't even recognize him. He looks younger and he's fit and he's got this kind of glow. And I was like, I, I need to know because Genius Leaves was like, what, what happened? He starts telling me all the things he's doing. And I was like, there's a lot of stuff we talk about on our podcast. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, yeah, we've been telling you about that for years. Yeah. He was like, yeah, but you know, uh, he, he's like a little while ago, I was off on a business trip, you know, killing myself. I came back and uh, my daughter was crying hysterically and um, had a nightmare that I had died, you know, oh. and she was like, she was broken and she was just like clinging on him. And he, that was, that was purpose for him, you know, and because of that, he had a reason and he got a result. So I'm just saying the P times E times S3, you start with purpose. Cause if you don't have a purpose, if you don't have purpose in reading that book, you're not going to remember what you read in that book. Mm-hmm. Right. And most people just, you know, read a page in a book, get to the end, just forgot what they just read because they didn't have purpose, right? And so I would say start with purpose and start with learning states and these states of curiosity and anticipation and focus. These are things you don't have. These are things that you could do and create, but always start with a reason. The, the, the second thing though, is someone could have unlimited, limitless purpose to work out or to read or to med- and, or to start a business or, or finally talk to that person they, they've been wanting to, to date and still not do it. Because the E is you need energy, right? Motivation. Somebody who is exhausted is not going to be very motivated to work out Mm. or to study that day or to make those calls they need to make, right? And so if you had a big process, let's say we're going back to working out or reading. If people have seen pictures of me with Elon or Oprah or whoever, people always ask how we connected. And I'm telling you, like, yes, we got connected by people in the same room, but how we maintained that was... A, a deep love of learning because anybody at that stage, they, they didn't get there by accident, right? They love to read, right? Mm-hmm. You read to succeed. Leaders are readers. We've heard this for years. As if someone has decades of experience like you do and you put into a book and somebody could read that book in a few days, they could download decades and days. That's the biggest advantage I yeah. think in life, period, right? The, Most, the, the ROI on reading books is just Yeah, and that's why we do these phenomenal. accelerated learning and speed reading programs at Facebook, Nike, Google, SpaceX, Virgin Galactic, you're right at Harvard, different places because especially, because you could spend four hours a day reading. Just think about all the emails and proposals and social media and magazines, all the research. If you could just, double your reading speed, cut that in half, save two hours a day, two hours a day over the course of a year, that's massive. Even if you save one hour a day over the course of a year, that's 365 hours. How many 40 hour work weeks is that? About nine, two months of productivity you get back saving an hour. And, and reading also, by the way, just for encourage you know, somebody who just has a book, you know, in one of our books or something on your shelf that you haven't read yet, you know, it's reading is to mind what exercises the body. I think it's one of the most, one of the best ways to, to be mentally, to stay mentally fit. But let's say you're not reading each each day. Like you want to, you committed to reading 30 minutes a day and you're not doing it. If you ate a big processed meal, maybe that's why, because you're, you're in a food coma, right? Or So the energy, you're saying, energy. so you've got the purpose, you've got the desire, you've got the motivation, mm-hmm. but because of maybe your lifestyle behaviors, you've got no energy to kind of, act yeah. on that 
purpose. Right. You have you have a purpose to drive somewhere, but you don't have the gas, the fuel to get you from here to there because you're in a food coma. Maybe you have a newborn child and you haven't slept in three days. You're not being yeah. very motivated to go to the gym that day. So I would just say, you know, a lot of what you and I talk about in our books and podcasts is how to get energy, how to manage stress because stress depletes a lot of energy, yeah. how to create a positive peer group because energy vampires could steal. I think some people are batteries included. They're born with it, but some people are Battery's not included and they're just stealing everybody else's energy, right? Or the foods, you're eating a lot of processed foods and high levels of sugars and not the best brain foods. You're not, or, and sleep, can we talk about, you know, like sleep? So if you're not getting that, then you're not gonna be, an exhausted person is not gonna be motivated, right? Yeah. And so an ex, exhaustion will make, a, make a, a coward out of anybody. You know, we're not gonna boldly go and do what we need to do. And then finally, you could have limitless purpose to do whatever you're trying to achieve to get out of that box, the, mo the money, the relationship, whatever. You could have unlimited amount of energy and still not be motivated because you need S3, small, simple steps. It's been my experience that sometimes when people set goals, I, I want to make the next unicorn. I want to find my romantic partner, live happily ever after my soulmate. I want to make a million, whatever it is. I want to have the six pack out per, it's way too big for somebody who hasn't been close to that. And how do you break that down in a small, simple step? Meaning maybe working out, you haven't done it and you've just, it's been on your to-do list and you're not doing it. That's too big. A small, simple step, put on your running shoes, right? If you can't get your kids to floss their teeth, get them to floss one tooth, right? Because yeah. little by little, nobody's going to stop at one tooth. Get them to put one sock when they're cleaning their room into the hamper, right? Or if you're not reading, get, you know, maybe 45 minutes of reading. By the way, it takes about 45 minutes for the average reader to read one book a week. The average person only reads, what, two books a year? You know, and there's a reason why Warren Buffett reads 500 pages a day. There's a reason why people love, you know, who are very successful read to shortcut, you know, the, the, the success achievement process, you know, but maybe it's, if you're not doing that 45 minutes a day is what it takes someone reading. So the average book has about 64,000 words. The average person reads about 200 words a minute. If you divide those numbers, 320 minutes to get through a book, divide by seven days in a week. 45 minutes a day, mm -hmm. 20 minutes, 4, 25 minutes, just break it down to reading periods. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit of work, but, you know, and that's the thing is, and I, and I, I know we subscribe to like, you know what, being, being, being sick is, is hard and, and eating right and exercising is hard. We, right, we choose our hard. <laughs> being broke is hard and working and, you know, studying and, and implementing things is hard and we choose our hard every day because we have that choice. And so when I'm going back to small, simple steps, maybe reading is too hard. Opening up a book is not hard. Reading one line is not hard. Right. So I think that how I get my small, simple step is I ask myself this key question. And I would invite everyone to write this down. What is the tiniest action that I could take right now that will give me progress towards this goal where I can't fail? What is the tiniest action I could take right now that will give me some progress towards this goal where I can't fail? You know, and so like then you'll get your like little, you know, uh, uh, BJ Fogg talks about tiny habits. Yeah. Right. And so you get your small, simple step because little by little, a little becomes a, a whole lot. And that that's really what, so when I'm working and coaching somebody or I want to be able to get them to do something that's going to be empowering, I I want to say, is this their mindset? Do they not believe it's possible? Do they not believe they, they're capable of doing it? Do they believe they deserve it? Then then you know where the intervention is, yeah. right? Um, if, or in motivation, do they not feel purpose? Do they know it intellectually, but they're not feeling the purpose? Do they not have enough energy, right? So they have to generate more energy. Maybe we have to check their stress or their sleep, you know, or, or, or their, um, their diet. And it, maybe they're just confused because this too, a confused mind won't do anything. Right. And so maybe we have to break it down into small, clear, simple steps. And then finally, the last M are your methods. And then those are the methodologies, right? On how to read faster, how to learn another language quicker, how to remember names, how to lose weight, right? right? How to be able to sleep better, whatever the method, how to invest and how to do something on with AI, whatever it happens to be. The reason I just put it last is if you don't have the yeah. mindset or the motivation, you're going to be stuck in that box. And so my, 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 my message to anybody, if you're going to sum this up, is I think out of the past few years, people feel a lot of fear. And when people feel fear, they're, they're looking for safety. Fear, they're not looking to grow because that's uncertain, right? And that, that could be mm -hmm. unknown and that could be very threatening. And so I would say that maybe have, look at it through a new lens, kind of like uh, Quincy was talking about. Maybe this is not a problem. Maybe this is a puzzle. Maybe instead of saying, maybe instead of downgrading your dreams to meet the current situation, 
maybe we should be thinking the opposite. Maybe instead of downgrading our dreams to meet this situation, maybe we should think about how do we upgrade our mindset? How do we upgrade our mo motivation? How do we upgrade our methods that we're using mm -hmm. to be able to meet those, those incredible dreams? Yeah, I love that. It's so comprehensive. And, and I think it really helps people understand why when they jump to methods without the preceding work, sure, yeah. you can make changes, but often those changes aren't long lasting. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, you can yeah, do yeah, it. Yeah, this yeah, is like yeah. your classic January two or three week mm -hmm. burst where you're doing the methods that you've learned about, but you haven't upgraded the mindset. You haven't yeah. upgraded your belief system. So I really, really like that approach. It's interesting talking hearing about your REMS. I have this kind of mnemonic for a morning routine that I've mm -hmm. written about. I've, I've made videos about that. The three M's of a morning routine for me are uh, mindfulness, movement, and mindset. So I love it. Again, I'm not saying it's for everyone. Yeah. You know, we all got to find what works for us. But for me, I started with some form of mindfulness practice. Mm. Could be breathing, could be meditation, something like that. Some form of movement. You know, I, I like to do a five minute kitchen strength workout while my coffee's brewing. It's a, it's yeah. a, it's a system I've got going. You stack get, those habits. Stack it yeah. very, very small. And then the third piece of me is mindset. Mm -hmm. So I always finish off uh, reading something uplifting or thought provoking mm. every morning. That That's kind of, I can do that in 15 minutes. If I have the luxury of 45 minutes, it can take 45 minutes, an hour, but it can also be compressed if I need to, to get those three mm. M's in. But for me and for many of my patients, they found that that's a very helpful framework to think about starting their day. I mean, you mentioned reading, and I know you also like me talk about the importance of setting up your environment. Yeah to make things easy. And so I've always got three or four uplifting books mm -hmm. kicking around my kitchen or my living room. Why? Because A, I'm reading them. B, so in the morning, I don't then have to think, oh, well, what am I going to read today? Yeah. You, know, you know, too much choice, procrastination. I just pick up one of the books that's there. Yeah. And before you know it, you've read a chapter. Yeah. So it's, and again, I want to tie in what you just said to what we were saying at the start, which is the importance of the morning. Yeah. Right? The importance of intentionally setting how your day is going to be. And, you know, you've shared some tools, I've mm -hmm. shared some tools, like things that people can think about. Because here's the thing, if you don't, and I get it, some people say they're busy, they don't have time. But the problem is if you start the day reacting, yeah. consuming, yeah. watching the news, right? You're, you're setting, your thermostat is set at a different temperature, right? Yeah. You, you, everything you experience that day yeah. is likely to be affected by that. You know, it's interesting, a few years ago, one of the things my wife stopped doing was watching anything negative, right? So at the time I was watching House of Cards, I started watching it, quite a few years ago now. And I thought, oh my God, this is amazing. I couldn't stop watching. And I said to my wife, I said, hey, Vid, come on, you've got to watch this with me. She said, she, I think she watched about five minutes of one of the episodes and says, that is way too dark for me these days. I am not watching that. Mm. And at the time I was a little frustrated because I was like, no, I want my wife to watch it with me. But actually it was fantastic because she has made a conscious decision. Yeah. And to some people, that's going to be extreme, mm -hmm. right? But actually, I think a lot of the things that we regard as extreme these days are necessary because of the world in which we're living, right? If you allow negativity in, don't be surprised when you have anxious thoughts. Don't be surprised when you're up at night thinking about the worst things that could happen in life, yeah. right? So again, we've all got to do what's right for, for mm -hmm. us, but she made an intentional choice and she stuck with it. She won't watch dark films. She mm -hmm. She's not interested. She's like, it may be great. The reviews may be fantastic, but I don't want to have that kind of energy state in my mind anymore. You're a brain coach. What would you say to that? I mean, it's similar to when people feed their body, right? They could feed themselves some gluten or whatever. And some people are more more sensitive to certain things. And I see that no different than you feeding your body certain foods that might be a little bit people, some people could enjoy in the moment and everything. And there may be maybe some long-term consequence, but they are willing to accept that. And other people are a little bit more sensitive and just saying like, I can't really do this right now you know, with mine. And, and so as you feed your body, you could also feed your, you're also feeding your mind. And food is information. 
certainly. Yeah. And Netflix is information also as as well. And again, it's just this I, I personally don't judge what people do. No. Me uh, and I know you don't either. And it's just but I but I do say that if people do that and then complain about something that's coming from that behavior, then I get a little bit like people getting resp- personally responsible. Yeah. Joe, I want to talk to you about reading a little bit and learning because you help people read quickly or quicker than they currently do. And it's interesting. One of my cousins the other day said to me, he's quite a bit younger than me, said, I just can't read books anymore. Like I I don't have the attention span to read, right? And I think many people feel like that. So they go, oh, it's not for me. And it may not be for them, but part of me feels that just many of us have untrained the skill or we've allowed technology to overwhelm us and we've now trained ourselves to be distractible. I kind of want to know your perspective on that. And then I wonder, maybe it's a good a good way of tackling this is to walk you through, I guess, my process for getting ready for podcasts, because that generally involves a lot of reading. So I yeah. can tell you what I do and you can maybe yeah, yeah, tell yeah. me how Absolutely. I can improve it. So first of all, maybe we tackle this thing. Are people able to read less than the past? Okay, so I focus, as we were talking about morning routines and touching your phone and doing those things, I think focus is a muscle. Right. And I don't think it's something you have. It's something that you do. And you could flex that muscle. And that's one of the reasons why I personally choose not to touch my phone the first half an hour, hour of the day. Because when you wake up in the morning, you know, and you're in this relaxed state of awareness, you're very suggestible. The first thing you do is pick up your phone, which has access to the world's information. And it, you're just context switching for thousands and thousands of times and, you know, in a, in a very short period of time. You know, you're rewiring your brain, number one, for distraction. Right, we talked about that, um, but you're also rewiring your brain for reaction, right? Because every, I don't know, voicemail, text message, email, whatever, could put you in a mood that could hijack mm-hmm. your mood. But in the beginning, you, you know, when you say you want to practice mindfulness in the morning, that's the la- that that's not very mindful, right? Just sharing, you know, switching from context. You mean to mindfully context. reading Instagram posts is right. not that mindful? <laughs> <laughs> well, even when I said people like, you know, brush their teeth, trying it with the opposite hand, it's not just about, you know, the, the cross lateral and potentially, you know, engaging a different part of their brain. I guess that that's, but it's also a gateway habit that allows, wow, if I could brush my teeth with the opposite hand, what else can I add in terms of stack my habits? But also, you're not going to be good at it at the, at the beginning. So it forces you to be mindful. So mindfulness doesn't have to be regulated just to meditation. We could bring mindfulness to when we eat, right? We could do everything. And then if you're eating with the opposite hand, as an example, right, then it forces you to be present, mm-hmm. right? And, and for me, I, I, I like that feeling as opposed to, you're right, it's not just what you eat, it's how you eat. Right, and a lot of people are working while they're eating, so they're not in that parasympathetic rest and digest place, and so they're probably not even getting a lot of you know the what they could get out of consuming. Um, and I'll go into the reading in a, in a moment. Just just on the consumption part in the morning, like another framework I use for my day, and I don't. It's not perfect, right? All these are like little filters. Generally, I like to keep the morning free, and of course, there's other things. Doctor appointment, I have to you know do this for for, for my, my child, and I have to do you know have this other podcast interview. But generally, in the mornings, I like to be I like to create. That's I found for me, uh, my brain mode in the morning is to be creative. So I want to output. In the afternoon, I tend to consume. And that's where I tend to do some study, uh, read for a podcast, listen to a podcast, have conversations with people. I tend to consume information. Um, so I'm putting information in. And then the last where I create, consume, in the evening, I want to clear. And that's what I'm trying to do. So I want to clear my mind, meaning I want to write down the things I have to do the next day, maybe so I could get it out of my mind so I don't have to ruminate about it. Mm-hmm. Or I want, maybe I'll use some yoga nidra and just do some breathing meditation to clear, you know, my, my mind, Mm -hmm. or maybe I'll journal and I'll just write it or I'll talk to my wife and talk about what I did that day to clear my mind. Fan of journaling? What's that? Are you a fan of journaling? I am. I am. I mean, why is why is it good for our brain? So for for me, I journal at two different times. I tend to journal in the morning and in the evening. That's my personal preference. And I'm again, it, people could find their own way and, and figure out what works. Um, in the morning, I, I do have this gratitude practice. I, I really think it's important. So many people actually will tell me that I'll, I'll I'll do a gratitude practice when I have something to be grateful for. 
something to that nature. And I was like, okay, that's, that's, that's interesting because I don't think you have to, and that's what I told this specific person. I was like, uh, maybe you don't have to wait for a greater life to feel grateful. Maybe if you feel grateful, you'll have a greater life. You know what I mean? Yeah. Cause I'm always like, just like the responsibility and power and reversing. And I just, I just find I, that's kind of my, my thinking style. Cause I think that for people to feel, how are you going to have more if you don't appreciate what you have? I know so many people, even clients that have a lot that they're just not very happy people. Some of them are miserable because they don't even appreciate, you know, the mm-hmm. things. And I think if people want to feel truly wealthy, a mental exercise I do is, uh, you know, write down all the things you have in your life that money can't buy. You know, if you could hear this right now, what are you willing to, you know, would you give up your hearing for a certain amount of money or, or whatever, right? <laughs> or a thought experiment, like what if, you know, what if the only things you had in your life tomorrow were the things you express gratitude for today? Not, not, not wrote it down, but actually express gratitude for mm-hmm. the people or the things, you know. And I just feel like gratitude is just a, such a healing emotion. Yeah. You know, it's just like, it trains my nervous system that there's enough, you know. And I think honestly, my experience has been what you appreciate, appreciates. Meaning what you appreciate in your life it tends to appreciate, meaning it enhances or gets or grows. Yeah. You know, and so that's what I want to have it, you know, th- that makes me feel good. And it also puts me in that kind of parasympathetic. So I tend to do gratitude in the morning and night. And I, it helps me for me to journal because I, everybody has a different process than sometimes you can imagine, but I like writing it down. I mean, I've, I very much echo those views about journaling. For me also, it's a morning and evening practice. Mm. I, In the morning, it's about gratitude. It's about setting an intention for the day, you know, similar practices, maybe word is slightly differently about trying to, frame the day you want to have. To make sure you're taking action after watching this video, I have created a free breathing guide that's going to help you reduce stress, calm your mind and boost your energy. In this guide, I share with you six really simple breathing practices that work immediately. Even just one minute a day will start to make a big difference. To receive your free guide, all you have to do is click on the link in the description box below. Um, it, again, it's about intention, right? It's about not living a, a reactive life, not being passive. It's about being active and about yeah. trying to generate the experience of life that you want. And then in the evening, you call it clearing, which is a really nice way to think about it. It's, it's about sort of reflecting on the day. Like a, a an athlete would always have a coach and reflect yeah. on their performance, right? That's how they get better. They, they assess, they go, yeah, but you can improve here. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, great. I can tweak it there. That's how they get better, right? That's how they become a high performer. But we all want high performance in our life, you know, whether it's high performance as a father, as a mother, as a work colleague, we all want those things. And and so I kind of feel a process of reflection is very, very important for us daily, if you can. I'm very biased towards analog things, right? Mm -hmm. I think as the world becomes more and more digital, yeah, you know, you've been in my kitchen, you've been in my house. It's a very analog setup intentionally. Yeah. In fact, me and my wife are currently having a discussion about a smart TV. I'm reluctant to get one because I want to make the behaviors that I don't want to engage in myself or I don't want my kids engaging in. I want them to be difficult to do at home. Mm-hmm. I don't want them to be easy. So I'm saying if we get a brand mm-hmm. new spanking TV where things work. Currently, we've got this old version box where Netflix takes like five or six minutes to load. It's a bit slow. I love it because Mm -hmm. that friction to do that behavior will often mean it doesn't happen. Right. So I'm, as the world becomes more and more digital, I personally like to set up things in an analog way at home, you know, and I like to write in nice journals that feel good. And I I, I just, I wanted to ask you before we go back to sort of reading, like, as a brain coach, as a memory coach, as someone who's spent what, over 30 years now helping people with the stuff, is the act of writing it down in your mind different from typing it into, let's say, an app in your phone? I mean, I've seen some research supporting that it is. Yeah. What's your perspective on that? Uh, my, that's been my experience also as well, especially with our students and the feedback that we get. Um, we have, you know, we have students in every country in the world, 195 nations, and people vastly prefer handwriting than, than typing, uh, digital. Let's, let's take note taking, right? We know that there's a learning curve, but there's also a forgetting curve that when you hear something on a podcast or in a lecture, uh, you can lose upwards of 80% of it within the first 48 hours. 
but in order to mitigate that, capturing it you know, is certainly great. Now, digital is great for storing. It's great for ease of sharing with your team and your family, right, and files. Um, but actually, when people are, when students are tested for the things that matter, comprehension, retention, handwriting notes exceed, uh, surpasses digital note taking. And part of, I'll give you one reason why, mm. is um, a lot of people are pretty good typers, and they could type as fast as you and I are speaking. But you can't possibly handwrite that fast. Mm. So it, what does it do? It forces you to filter. Yeah. Like, is this important and organize the information? So you're not just because the worst way of taking notes is having everything verbatim. That's not helping anybody, right? All the research has you know shown that keywords are more important than just having a transcript of necessarily of given that. It certainly helps to read it, but if you could pull out information and and do practice retrieval and test yourself and teach somebody else, you're going to learn it you know, way far better. But um, I, I, I prefer lifestyle more analog because I don't need another reason to get on a screen. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit hard when I'm traveling because I like to read. So, you know, I can't necessarily bring five books, you know, my, and, you know, traveling on it with a carry on or something like yeah. that. Um, but I, I like, I'm very tactical. And also I do like handwriting because even in just thinking about it logically, right? Leadership or innovation, it's, it's an inside out process, right? You're taking something invisible in your mind and you're making it invisible, like an invention or a, or one of your books, right? Or a podcast, you're taking something in your mind before it actualizes phys- in the physical environment. And I love handwriting something. And I've always been like this because it's, it's the first step of making something in your mind visual on the outside, Yeah, you know? And I think that's the beginning. That's the first step of the creation process. Going back to the conversation about reading speed, how do you read? So right now we have the right mindset, right? The leaders are readers, that reading is your mind, would exercise your body, you have purpose. So you're not reading without intention, right? P times E times S3. And the methodology is, okay, so first first of all, I want to make it easy. Just like you were saying, like, you don't want to get a smart TV and you want you want Netflix to load in split second because you want to make it difficult. And, that, and that's part of, you know, designing habits, proper habits. You want to make the things that are not good for you more difficult. Like if you don't have your phone by, on your nightstand, you know, when you're sleeping, then you're not going to pick it up, right? Yeah. It's like putting it in, in your bathroom is probably a safer place, Be, you know, and just like doing the things I want, like I, I put a, a kettlebell and a chin up bar, right? You know, at the entrance yeah. of my office and I'm just like, I see it and it was just easy to do just like you do something when you're, when you're doing your making your coffee. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's why not make the good things that are good for you easy to do and the things that are not good for you more difficult, you know? So if you are going to get that thing, that, that alcohol, whatever, why don't you put it in the basement in a very difficult place, you know? So you have to, oh man, I don't want to go all the way downstairs and do that or that candy bar or whatever, or just not have it in your home, (laughs) you know, which makes it a lot easier. Just like if you don't, if not good with bread, like it doesn't agree with you and you're at a dining table, you know, and they bring you bread, you could either look at that bread and say, no, 20 times in your mind throughout that whole evening yeah. or you could just say no when they bring it to you and yeah. then you don't have to say no every single time you use up all that 100%. energy and tension. Yeah. So going back to the power of purpose, I'm the same way with my reading, right? And I set up my environment just like you do. I have books specifically around and I do read multiple books at, at, at a time and I'm a big fan, you know, especially the past few years of reading fiction books. Um, that it's a lot of times I'm, I'm, I obsess about nonfiction. I'm like, what's the purpose in this? I want to read a books on, you know, on, on neuroscience, adult learning theory. Um, and, and I've seen so many benefits of reading fiction and even research shows it, it improves empathy, um, you know, character development, imagination, yeah. uh, problem solving, pattern recognition. It also, it, it also, um, improves your EQ. You know, where we're reading maybe something else is your IQ. This is more your your emotional quotient. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I also schedule my reading. And so I, I'll say this. So I mentioned that it takes about, if you're, if you're a basic reader, 200 words per minute, then um, you get through a book 45 minutes a day. So I schedule that. And I recommend everyone schedule. Because if you don't schedule your workout or you don't schedule your meditation, I mean, we schedule a parent-teacher meetings and doctor's appointments and investor meetings or client team meetings, whatever, but we're not scheduling our own growth. So, so you, you've said, I think before, reading is a workout for your mind. Is yeah, that what you said? I, I think reading is to your mind what exercises to your body. So, yeah. so then if we use that analogy and go, yeah, you scheduled your physical workouts, yeah. 
you need to also schedule your mental workouts. Yeah, and I think some people don't even don't schedule the physical workouts and they don't get to it. And so they want because life fills up those yeah. voids and then it's at night and it's, it's after dinner like oh, I forgot to work out or I just don't have the energy to work yeah. out. And that's the thing is prioritizing the most important things, keep the most important things, the most important things. And I think <laughs> top of that is self-care, you know, and self-care is not just, you know, working out. I think also part of self-care is self-love. You know, we started that in the beginning of the conversation that part of our journey is, you know, looking in the mirror and falling in love with that person looking back that's been through so much, but is, but is mm -hmm. still standing, right? Just like how you're saying, if you love yourself, you're not going to, I mean, this a, like, if you really deeply care about yourself, you're not going to do things that would potentially harm it by eating certain things mm -hmm. or, or, or otherwise, just like you wouldn't do that things for someone you love. And just if you love somebody else, and I would say no amount of love from somebody else is going to give your soul what it needs from you, right? Yeah. The love and caring and compassion you need from you. And I'm not saying it's easy, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, and this whole thing, nothing I'm saying is necessarily easy. I, I would do say it's simple, but simple doesn't mean yeah. easy, right? And so what I would do is schedule it because if you don't schedule, I think the number one productivity performance tool we have is our calendar, right? But if you don't put it down in your calendar, it's not, it's likely not going to get done. So I would schedule that 45 minutes or 20 minutes of reading, whatever you're committed to, you know, also as well. Um, when you have a book, if you're reading, okay, so you prefer analog. And if you're watching this on video, you know, I'm just grabbing my book, yeah. you know, so like even basic things, right? When I'm looking at this, and I, and I open up the book, when I'm looking at it at this angle here, so I'm, I'm taking the book and I have it flat on the table uh, for those who are just listening to this. If I'm looking at this angle from where I'm sitting, I'm sitting upright, then the, the, the words appear smaller at this angle because I'm looking at it at an angle. And now some people, what they'll do unconsciously to make it easier for them to read is they'll slump over like this so they could see the words better. But when I did that, what happens? I go into this kinesthetic posture, which is slower than visual posture. I, I collapse my diaphragm, which we talked about is also the key to getting mm -hmm. more oxygen to your brain. That's why people fall asleep when they're reading often because of their, their physiology is affecting wow. their psychology. I would also say when you're reading something and, I'm a, and you're going through enjoying this, number one, have an intention. Why, why are you reading this book? Because the fastest way to read something is not to read it at all. Right. So if you ever read a page in a book and got to the end, just like nothing registered, maybe you don't have questions. Going back to the reticular activating system, how a part of it is initialized by questions. So it's kind of like a long time ago, you know, maybe 20 years ago, my, my, my sister would send me these uh, pictures and email postcards of a very specific kind of dog, breed of dog, pug dogs, right? Mm -hmm. These kind of smushy, fun dogs with smushy faces. And um, they're very compliant. You could dress them as like ballerinas and they're just, oh, whatever. Um, and, and, and I was like, why? My question was, why is she sending me these? And she's a good marketer because she's seeding because her birthday is coming up, right? And I was like, okay. And funny thing happened. When I started asking the question, I started seeing these pug dogs everywhere. Like I'd be at the grocery store checking out and the person in front of me is holding a pug dog. <laughs> and I'm running in my neighborhood and somebody's walking six pug dogs on a leash. And my question for everyone listening is, did these pug dogs magically appear in my neighborhood? And no, of course not. But I wasn't paying attention because again, your brain is primarily a deletion device, right? So we're not shining mm -hmm. a spotlight. And so we, it's in the dark for us. And so, but once I started asking the question, I just started seeing the pug dogs everywhere. And so my question for everyone listening is what are your dominant questions? You know, my dominant question was how do I be invisible? So I got really good ideas on how to shrink and not be seen in class. And that was my result. You know, a dominant question I talk about in the book is uh, a friend of mine found out her dominant question out of the 60,000 thoughts. Some of them are questions. The one she asks all the time, how do I get people like me? And you don't know anything about her, but you know, you know her career, where she lived, but you know a lot about her. Someone's obsessed with how do I get this person to like me? That's the question they're asking. What, what's their life like? Their personality. You know, they're, they're a martyr. People take advantage of them. They're mm -hmm. a sycophant. Their personality changes depending on who they spend time with because they want to be liked. Um, and it's interesting, you know, like you don't know anything about her, but you know a lot about her because you know the question. And my principle here that I'm talking about, questions are the answer. You know, like the, the, the example I put in the book with Will Smith, you know, I train a lot of actors how to speed read scripts, memorize lines, and I'll give you some of the speed reading tips in a moment. 
just because these these illustrations, these stories stick with people. Um, we were tra brain training during the day. We're in Toronto in the winter. In the evening, he's shooting his movie, right? Superhero movie. And it is cold and it is not, people think it's very sexy and very thrilling to be on a movie set, but it's, it's really just people <laughs> just waiting all the time. And during this waiting outside, his family's there and I'm there outside and we're, we're freezing, just kind of watching these monitors underneath this tent. And he's bringing us hot chocolate that he made himself, even though there's a crew that can make it for him. And, and you know, he, and he's uh, cracking jokes and telling stories. And I found out earlier that day, his dominant question is, how do I make this moment even more magical? How do I make this moment even more magical? And I realized that evening, you know, he was demonstrating that question at that time uh -huh. by making the hot chocolate and cracking. He's just bringing more magic into it, you know. And my, my dominant question could be like, you know, what's the best use of this moment, right? I mean, you know, you, you read the book uh, Zero to One by Peter Thiel. You know, he says like, you know, if you had to reach your 10-year goal, but you were only given six months to do it, how would you go about doing it? And you ask a different question, you're going to get a way different answer, mm -hmm. right? And so my, my question for everyone listening, what do you think your dominant question is? Because that determines your focus and that focus determines how you feel and what you do and what you experience in your life. Do you have your dominant question? Yeah, for the longest time it was, how do I make this better? Because remember, I felt like I was broken. So my dominant question came out of my struggle. So I was like, how do I make this better? Right? It's a very empowering question that, isn't it? It, it is because then I start shining a light and saying, oh, there's a pug dog, there's a pug dog, there, there's an answer, there's an answer, there's an answer. But even within the question is the energy of agency. Like it's mm -hmm. built into the question. That's why for me, it's such a wonderful question. Yeah. It's, you can't adopt a victim mindset with a question like that. Yeah, and that's, and that's great. I got goosebumps again, because that's, again, I call them truth bumps, because the, the presupposition is you do have the power to make it better, mm -hmm. right? And so people could ask a question like, how do I make the most of this moment? right? The three questions I ask when I read, going back to the reading nonfiction, preparing for a podcast, how can I use this? Why must I use this? When will I use this? So think about the power if you're reading something and not normally getting, you know, maybe 10% of what you think you could get out of it. If you start reading something, a book on health and wellness, on, on glucose and whatever you happen to reading, how can I use this? Then you're like, oh, there's, there's a pug dog, there's a pug dog, there's a pug dog. Right? Just like in when I teach students how to do well in standardized tests, like reading comprehension, you know, I always tell them, go read the questions at the end first and then start reading the, the, the reading mm. comprehension. Then you're like, because then you know what the author is looking for. Then you have answer, there's answer, there's answer. Why read all this, get to the end and not, and they're like, oh, that's what was important. Right. And so you ask your question. So in the beginning of my book, every single chapter starts with three primary questions to activate their reticular activating system. So they're looking for that answer. Mm. So when they read it, they're like, oh, there's a pug dog, there's a pug dog, there's a pug dog. So three questions I ask every day of my life, especially when I'm in learning mode, how can I use this? Right. Then I'm like, there's the answer there. I could use it this way, this way, this way, this way. Why must I use it? So it goes my head to my heart. So I have purpose. Right? I think about all the mm. rewards and how my business, my podcast will be better. My book will be better. How can I use this? Why must I use it? Because without reasons, you won't get the results. Just like asking, why do I remember the person's name? And then I say, when will I use this? And that's the scheduling. Because I going back to the lie, limited idea, entertain, the knowledge is power. It's not. It's potential power because power when we utilize it. I have a primary belief that every hour you spend listening to a podcast like this, to be fair, you should spend an equal hour putting it into action, right? Every hour you spend reading a book, every hour you spend in a lecture, you should spend an equal hour putting it into play, right? And that, I think that, because otherwise nothing happens. If nothing, if nothing changes, nothing changes, right? I want to get yeah. really like fundamental. And then when will I use this? And then I schedule it. I'm like, oh, this is a great thing. I know why I should use this. And then I schedule like, oh, I'm going to do this, yeah. you know, do this, add this part to my podcast here. So one of the ways in which people can get better at reading mm -hmm. is by asking the right questions beforehand. Yeah. Like I, what I'm thinking about is, is let's say someone's bought a book that they heard a guest on a podcast, so I'm going to buy that book, yeah. but the book hasn't been read yet, but they took the action, they bought mm -hmm. it. And some days they're trying to look at it and they're probably reading the same page over and over yeah, again, yeah. that and they just can't move forward with it. So why might that be? Well, I don't know. To me, it's like, okay, you could be tired, right? Yeah. So nothing's going in that day. 
it could be that the book was poorly written, mm -hmm. right? So therefore, it's not you. It's actually the the book isn't that well written, which mm -hmm. does happen. Mm -hmm. um, or I'm guessing it could be that you're not you've not primed yourself in the right way to read it. Is that is that sort of how you yeah. would look at it? And 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 built in everything you just said again, uh, personal responsibility and agency. It, it's it's there. You know, even even if it's not a book and it's a lecture, I'll even find. I'll notice I'll control my state. Like I have to, I go to a lot of conferences. I speak for a good part of my living and I can be on three continents in one week. We're in front of 250,000 people a year, usually at live events. And I could be sitting in the audience waiting to go on and somebody else is speaking on something in the industry. And, um, and I can see the effect by looking at people around me as they're falling asleep, right? Mm, We've all yeah. been at lectures like this or even in, in school. <laughs> And and and, but, and I'll I'll take agency. I I honestly I will do this, uh, just not not because I'm so enlightened. It's just I don't want to be bored, right? I want to control how I feel because I'm a thermostat. I'm not a thermometer. I don't want to be bored just because that reacting to people. And I'll 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 change my mindset. I'm like, wow, this is fascinating. How's this dude like putting everybody to sleep all at the same time? And I'll actually get curious and I'll get energized thinking about that. But that's how I'll entertain myself. Even, you know, or if I'm in a movie and I have to stay in the movie and I don't, I, you know, I don't want to leave because I have family there or, or friends. I'll just like think about other things about how I could apply this and use this and, and so on. Because I'll, I'll, I'll take responsibility for how I feel and, and what I'm thinking and, and what I'm doing. We could always control our mindset, our motivation, which are our feelings yeah. and the methods, our behaviors. So the same situations going on but your experience of that situation now becomes very yeah. different doesn't it very very good and and not written just like if a book is poorly written i could try to find the gems there or i could take responsibility and say i'm this is not book it's not for me and that's still my agency i could walk out of that movie yeah or, or walk out of that speech or anything else so i start with having the right questions and have purpose like i i read with intention or i listen with intention right people aren't randomly listening to your show they, they, they could because they like you right? And they know you offer mm -hmm. value. And they would get even more if they, if they thought like, oh, like what are the kind of questions that I have so I could have, because you pull information inside here by asking questions, right? And if you don't have those questions, nothing's going to register because you can't push information to somebody's head, right? A podcast can push information, but you could pull it in. Yeah. It's interesting, Jim. I've maybe for two or three years now on the audio version, so not the YouTube version, on the mm -hmm. audio version, when I record my outros, I always say, you know, what's one thing you can take away from yeah. this conversation and start applying into your life? And I do that very intentionally because it's like, okay, you've heard a lot. Yeah. You've hopefully been inspired, but let's just make it one thing. What's one thing yeah. you can take away and apply? But as I was um, researching you for this conversation, you talk about the importance of... You know, you've already mentioned how much we retain, how much we forget mm -hmm. within 48 hours. And you talk about the importance of teaching it when you yeah. teach it to someone else. So I was thinking maybe for next season, I might um, tweak my outro yeah. to be, instead of just one thing you can apply and what's one thing you can teach someone else about what you learned? Do you, know, yeah, would that, yeah. do you think that would make a difference? Yeah, I think I think both. Both make it maybe rich, but if you want to single one out and people could test this because everyone's a little bit different, but I, but I learned so I could teach, right? And I, I have a philosophy that when you teach something, you get to learn it twice. And I also feel like we teach the things we most want to learn. That's a different subject because I wanted... I was a poor learner, right? And my struggle became my strength. And uh, so I teach other people how to learn. I think that if you give someone an idea, you enrich their life. But if you teach someone how to learn, they can enrich their own life. Kind of like that old, like, uh, learn how to fish. Yeah. And so what I would say is, yeah, absolutely. If you want to learn, okay, so when you're reading this book, have a purpose for doing so. You know, notice that I just want to close this out, that if I... If I'm not going to bend my body, and if you're not watching this in video, I have the book again um, on the tabletop, and I'm I'm my I'm in visual posture, meaning I'm upright and I'm breathing properly, and I don't want to see it at an angle. So instead of collapsing my body, I just want to close this loop. Then you can just move the book, right? So now I could see the book and at an angle, I can even rest it on the table or rest it on my knee. And that makes a difference. It does because wow. over time, especially if you're reading faster, you know, part of what keeps people reading slowly is just visual fatigue. Yeah. Right. So if, if the if the book is at an angle, then it's the words are smaller, so more difficult to read logically. Yeah. But if they're tilted towards me, then all of a sudden they they are noticeably larger and easier to read. 
right? Yeah, I love that. And then I have questions, you know, that I'm asking. So then I say, oh, there's an answer, there's an answer, there's an answer. So I never get in a situation where I read something and I just forget what I just read or not, didn't understand it. It just like time passed when you, in one eye out the other or whatever. And then I'm asking questions. Now that, that's for smart reading. But for speed reading, if you want greater speed, like, like all we teach is not, it's not skimming or scanning. Like we work with a lot of attorneys, a lot of financial advisors, a lot of medical doctors. You don't want your you don't want your doctor to get the gist of what they're, you know, what she, they're reading, right? <laughs> uh, I, I don't, I don't. So, you know, so a lot of traditional speed reading is scanning, skipping words, getting the uh, gist of what you read, right? And that, 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 that's never worked for me because I started as a memory trainer. So one of the ways you can improve your reading speed is first of all, get your base rate, all right? So I would say, put a mark in the margin, pick up a book that you're reading or a brand new book, put a little mark in the margin where you're, starting uh, currently today, may might be somewhere in there. And then read for 60 seconds, set a timer, your phone to go down for 60 seconds and have it ring. And then put a mark in the margin where you left off. So in 60 seconds, and then count the number of lines you just read and it counts, you know, you could guesstimate, right? So don't, if there's two words in a line, don't count it as a line. And then you have your lines per minute, right? That's how many lines you read in a minute. And you could easily also kind of approximate how many words there are per line. And most books you'll find about 10 words per line, right? If I was to count or average the, the average number of words per line, mm. about 10. So let's say you go through and you read like 20 lines in, to simplify it in 60 seconds, 200 words per minute, right? Then that's by the way, about the average reading speed, about 200, 250 words per minute. Now, if I ask you to pick up where you left off and put the clock on 60 seconds again, pick up where you left off, but just do one thing different is what I'm going to ask you to do is just underline the words with your finger or a pen. Not, not you're actually not marking it, but just like use it as a visual pacer. And a visual pacer is, it could be a pen, a highlighter, a mouse on a computer, right? I use my finger because everyone carries them with them, right? So you don't have to worry about them. You have them at all, at all times. If you just underline the words, right? You don't even have to touch the page. And you did that for 60 seconds and count the number of lines you just read, that second number will be on average 25, 50% or more. So, okay, I love mm -hmm. this. So you, you you read one section to get your baseline. Right. Then you, you're you not rereading that. No. You go into a new you section. Pick up, so you're putting a mark in the margin where you start yeah. and where you end, count the number of lines and you have your base rate. And then the second time, all you're doing is as you're reading the new uh, mm -hmm. piece of, uh, or yeah. the new words, you left off. you're just underlining with your finger. Yeah. You're just going Keywords. under nine. You're not, yeah, exactly. You're just going left to right, left to right, left to right, right, back, left to right, back to left and not right. And you're just- Not uh, everything, just keywords. Every, every, no, no, you're not marking it. You're just literally using your finger and going right underneath and like this. Exactly oh, the whole like thing. This. Yes, just like this. And you're just following your eyes across the page like this. Wow. I'm telling you, you don't have to believe everything I'm saying. Everyone, listen, just pick up a book and do it and then count the number of lines you did, even without practice. You haven't even practiced this, but if you practice it, it'll even be more. And I'll tell you why logically, because as human beings, you know, we want the explanatory schema, the reasons why. A couple of reasons. First of all, kids naturally, when they're learning to read, will use their finger while they read mm. to help them to focus until, depending on what kind of school system you want, you got unique feedback. Some people got a ruler to their hand or whatever because, you know, they wanted, and I'm not saying that I'm, there's a conspiracy trying people not to use their finger because they want to keep people ill-informed or anything. I'm not saying that. But if you just use your, it's interesting, kids organically, we use it. You use their fingers to help them focus. Um, interesting also, we do it. So, I, when you do this, notice when I ask you to count the number of lines you just read, everyone will start with doing what? Using their finger to point one, two, three, four, five, or a pen, one, two, three, mm. because you're using a visual pacer to count because you know it helps you to focus. So why not use that while you read? The third reason why you use your finger while you read or a visual pacer, again, you can be using a, you know, a pen across, you're not marking it, right? You're just going right above the line is because your eyes are attracted to motion. Because as hunter and gatherers, like if you're in a bush and you're hunting lunch, right? There's a rabbit there, or there's carrot, whatever your lunch is, right? If a bush next to you moves, you have to look at what moves because that's survivor, survival. It, number one, it could be lunch or number two, you could be lunch, right? So you have mm -hmm. to look at what moves in your environments. And so when you're underlining the words across the page, left to right and back and forth, your eyes are being pulled through the information as opposed to your attention being pulled apart. 
mm-hmm. right? And the other reason why, because right now, if something, someone just walked across the room that we're in, everyone would look, even people watching on video, right? You and I, all of us, because your eyes are tracked into motion. So when your finger is going across the page, your attention is being pulled through it and it maintains your focus. But the, another reason, if we didn't, that wasn't reason enough, it's how your neurology is set up. Certain senses work very closely together. So for example, do you love like a, a, a fresh piece of fruit? Like not like right off the vine, right it's from the farmer's market. Not something that's been sprayed in wax and sitting in a store for six months, but something yeah, like, for sure. have you ever tasted a great tasting uh, peach? Yeah. Yeah. And so in actuality, we're not tasting that peach. We're, we're, we're what, are we, what are we doing? We're smelling that peach. The tongue is not capable of really tasting what a peach tastes like. But the sense of smell and taste are so closely linked that your mind can't perceive the difference. It can perceive the difference when we're sick. If your nose is congested, what do a lot of foods taste mm. like? Tastes bland, right? Yeah. Because your sense of smell and taste are so closely linked, wow. so is your sense of sight and your sense of touch in your nervous system. So like if, like, um, you know, we have, we have, we have, we have a newborn baby, you know, if I was, to, and starting to like, you know, grass. If, but if you're going to infant and take your keys and just sh- shook the keys in front of the infant or, you know, that who understands and say, look at, look, look, look at these keys. What would, what would the child naturally do? Grab them, right? Mm. Because that they associate looking with, with touching, right? In fact, when people read using their finger, they say they feel more in touch with their reading yeah. over time. Oh, here's, here's another way. If someone loses their sense of sight, how do you read? Use you, you braille. braille, touch, right? And so, I would encourage everyone to do is just a, just a kind of a, a quick tip because obviously, you know, we we do trainings. Thirty yeah, you day do trainings. full yeah. courses that people yeah, can sign a, up for. A, yeah, ten minutes a day for thirty days, and we'll triple anyone's reading speed with much better comprehension. But even if you just underline the words while you read, you'll feel not only greater speed, a lift twenty five fifty percent, but you'll feel more in touch with your reading also as well, especially if you're adding the questions and everything else we yeah. talked about. And so I would say everyone could experiment with that. There's, if people, can I give a link? Yeah, sure. If people go to jimquick.com forward slash more, kwik.com forward slash more, there's actually a free one hour masterclass where you can, I'll actually work and walk you through it. You bring a book online and I'll show you how to do this visually. And I'll show you some really cool shortcuts, but that will boost your readings to be 25, 50%. And that does, that's not a little bit, that's a lot. That's a lot. Right? If they say time is money, how many people got a 25, 50% return on their investments last year, right? So it, it really adds up over time and little by little, a little becomes, it becomes a whole lot. Yeah. I mean, thanks for sharing that. That's brilliant. I mean, I, I, I guess I would, I've never measured, I would consider myself a quick reader mm-hmm. relative to what I see around me, yeah. but I don't do that. I don't think I put my finger there. So I'm already yeah. really excited because I, I reckon I get through two to three books a week just for this mm-hmm. podcast. Yeah. Right. And I think it's interesting hearing you talk about uh, learning and reading and like I, what, what have I intuitively found over five and a half years of doing this show works for me? Well, I don't do, I never will allow the publisher to send me an electronic book. Like, so it has to be a hard copy. Mm. It's just, again, I don't want any more excuses to be on a screen. So right. it's a hard copy book. And initially I had to get over this hump of writing in books because initially I don't know, I can't, I can't put a colored pen inside this book. I can't mm-hmm. underline something. This is like a work of art, you know, but I've, I've got over that. Like yeah, I yeah, will yeah, literally yeah. with my colored pens, yeah. I will read stuff. I'll underline key sentences. And of course I've got some of those questions are built in because I know the guest is coming in two days, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm going to be on the mic. So yeah. I want to be well prepared. I, I don't have a research. I do it all myself. Yeah. So I, I'm reading the book. I'm underlining, uh, keywords, key phrases, sometimes stroke often I'll have a journal next to me and I'll write down key quotes or key ideas. Yeah. But there are only words or a few words. I don't write questions for my guests. I don't have set questions. I just have themes and ideas that I want to go through. So I let it sort of I hopefully just breathe organically and yeah. see where we go to in a conversation. And then 
I guess, roughly one hour before the guest arrives in the studio, you know, give or take, sometimes it's half an hour, sometimes it's 90 minutes before, but I would say on average an hour before the guest comes, I look at the notes I made in a journal Mm -hmm. and then I open up this book, which is my sort of podcast book now, and I will just write down key words, key ideas, try and put them in some, you know, group yeah. them in certain areas. Uh, I will use colours. Yeah, Colours are really important for me. They always have been, even as a kid when I was revising at school, I've always wanted a black, red, green and blue pen. And, you know, here's the irony. I, I, I very rarely look at these things when I'm actually in the conversation, mm-hmm. but they actually, I think they almost just prime my brain. They almost allow me to consolidate the information that I've absorbed mm-hmm. and they give me a safety net one hour before a guest arrives in case I ever forget what I'm saying or in case I run out of things to say, which I don't think I've, I can't remember the last time I did that. But I don't know, that's kind of a a brief sort of overview of my process. What does that sound like to you and how might you improve it? Yeah. And I I love it. Have you always been, so you're very, you're very good at putting things in action and you, you, you're very, you're very fast to to implement things like that. Uh, You tend to be very, um, more intuitive also yeah. in terms of... Well, I've just done your brain quiz and you don't know the answer. So we'll go through that in a minute. I'll tell you what my, uh, okay. you know, where we got to with that. But yeah, I would say that's right. Yeah. So, you, all right. So when you're talking about a broad brain quiz, because I'll, I'll customize it for what, what we're talking about. So your process obviously works because you've refined it over, you know, lots of episodes and a number of years. Right. And so we tend to, with all our learning, as you have a certain level of schema and background information, start making things more elegant. And I really do believe that it's not how smart we are, it's how are we smart. You know, after, you know, especially in the work we do in education, it's not how smart you are, how smart your significant other, how smart your kids are, how smart your team is, how are they smart? And we all have a preferred way of learning Mm -hmm. and executing, right? Uh, Beyond learning styles. Um, you mentioned the brain quiz. So over over the past 12 months, you know, we refined our teaching and just as there's personalized medicine or personalized nutrition. This is a way of kind of personalizing your learning around how you prefer to learn or lead or live. All right. And we've, you know, I pulled as inspiration from, you know, Myers-Briggs and left brain, right brain dominance theory and multiple intelligence uh, theory. Um, and all, all these different areas to, to, and we've discerned that there are about four cognitive types. And I think everybody could, I'll go through them really quick. Everyone could kind of see themselves in that or see friends like, oh, I know what animal that person's going to be. Um, for you, I would, I would guess it was a, a cheetah if I was a guess. Um, and I, I, I made it simple. It was. I made, okay. <laughs> for me, it's code, C-O-D-E. And uh, everything is your brain code. And people could take this, it only takes a few minutes, like probably take like three, four minutes. Yeah, three, four four minutes. minutes. It's really fun, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So people can do it for free. They can just go. Yeah, it's uh, mybrainanimal.com, mybrainanimal.com. And you can see what brain animal you are. Now, the animals are the letters C-O-D-E, code. So the C is the cheetah. The cheetah are your fast actors. They, they implement very well. They uh, tend to be very intuitive also as well. Mm-hmm. So that you write notes, but you go by your intuition. You don't yeah. have to refer to it. It's just you're, you're in the moment and you could, and you could, you could, you could pitch and, and toss right back and forth. And yeah. I love that because you're such a great listener and we could go fast paced because I, I like, I like quickness also as well. You know, it's, it's part of, part of my style. And, uh, and you don't just learn things, you, you put things in action. You know, I, I've seen your show over, over the amount of years and just like you are, you're nailing, you're just like even how, how your platform has grown because you, you're implementing things and you're just probably thinking like, and, and you, you thrive in, in fast paced environments and maybe because in medicine you had to do that, yeah. you know, right? it, it trained you to be able to, you know, to be quick on your toes and be a quick thinker, right? The O are your owls. And we're not any one of them. You have a primary and a secondary because um, we're all, all blend. Nobody's 100% any of these animals. But it gives you a filter, just like when I was going through the limitless model of how to look at transformation, how to look at leadership, how to look at learning. The O, owls are, owls represent logic, right? They, they love data 
and you could you could probably you could that might be your secondary. You you love data, facts, and figures, and formulas. You love white papers. Mm-hmm. You know you like to look at that at the the evidence there. And and now by the way, like they these are two people that could also blend, but they could also learn differently, right? Or be or they invest differently, mm-hmm. right? Uh, a Cheeto could invest in, in certain ways, you know, and t- maybe tolerate a little, a little bit of risk, do things on intuition. You know, an owl's more look. You know, I want I want to see I want to see these numbers and so on. Do their diligence. The okay, the D in code, cheetah, owl. The D are your dolphins. These are your creative visionaries. These are great problem solvers. They have an exceptional ability to do pattern recognition also as well, as you can imagine. Uh, they have great imagination. They're creators, mm-hmm. right? And then finally, the E are your elephants. And your elephants, I would say they're, they're highly empathetic, strong interpersonal skills. Mm-hmm. Uh, they thrive in, in collaborations, team environments also as well. And this is a highly abbreviated you know, a version. But when people go, we've designed very specific questions and usually people know which answer it is or they struggle between, is it this one or this one? Yeah. Right? I didn't overthink it. I just right. thought, what was the first and one that's... And that's the perfect way of doing it because yeah. that's what a cheetah would do. <laughs> um, and then afterwards... I, I like the idea of being a cheetah, I must then, say. <laughs> yeah, when, when you get... Um, You'll also get uh, you know, a report for you, and we we customize personalized learning depending on what brain animal is your dominant and your primary. This is how I would go about reading. This is how I go about studying or note taking or memorizing oh, wow. something. So, so depending or, on which four mm-hmm. you are, the relevance says is that you'll send people who do that quiz online like a personalized way. Yes. Of tackling life, even, I even, guess. Even things like goal setting, like a cheetah, like they, they go in sprints. So we said, you know, like even recommendation for goal setting and goal getting, you'll see this report on on a cheetah it's creating uh, clear s- short-term goals, right? Going from here to here to here, because that's that would be aligned with your personal performance cognitive type. Mm. And it's interesting. And then I, I also weave in stories in there of these four animals, kind of like a child's book, where you could see these these four animals at play at school or at work. Right, yeah. because it's interesting when you have your team do it, because we got a lot of insight also, because um, we also see the back end, all the numbers in terms of what percent you know are are are, are each in different environments. If I speak at a leadership conference or I speak at a entrepreneur event or a student event, um, but it, our team, it was interesting, you know, where our customers, like our customer experience people, were really in that in that empathetic kind of kind of space, you know, and our finance person was clearly an out. Like it's it's interesting yeah. because I also show people, I give them sample careers where you would thrive because based on your predilection for logic or or, or speed or, you know, empathy and so on. So it, it's kind of fun. It's at mybrainanimal.com and, you know, we're we're loving we're loving this because it informs, I think in order to be happy. And I'm looking forward to having you on, on my show and talk about a, a happy mind and a you know, very full life. In order to be happy, I feel like you need two things. You need to have the curiosity to know yourself hmm. and then the courage to be yourself. Meaning that, you know, the curiosity to know yourself, that's why we go to, you go to therapy, you know, uh, you journal, you do the inner work, right? And you get to know yourself, you know, your identity, what you believe in, what you stand for, what you value, in, you know, in your life, what's important to you, what you live for. So, but once you have that, you know, I think a lot of people have, have done some of that work. Yeah. And, and it's deep work. But then having the courage to be yourself. The, so having the curiosity to know yourself, but then having the courage yeah. to be that person. Love that. You know, because sometimes, you know, I spent a lot, I lost my own so when I had my head injury, my parents were working a lot. So I was, I had a lot of and three accidents before age of 12. My grandmother was my primary, you know, caregiver. Um, she, when I was going through these issues, showed, started showing early signs of dementia and the passing of Alzheimer's. She would call me by my father's name, um, you know, uh, say something she just said and just the situation. Um, so, so we donated, um, a good portion of the proceeds to this book to not only build schools around the world, Ghana, Guatemala, Kenya, healthcare, clean water, build this this actual facilities, teachers, um, but also Alzheimer's research for women because women are twice as likely to experience Alzheimer's than, than men. And yet a lot of the research is done on male brains, treatment is on male brains. So that's something I'm very passionate about. But that informed what I would do as a living you know, in terms of education and brain health you know, for this. But I spent a lot of time because of it. I didn't have 
the, um, I lost all my grandparents very early. Um, I, I spent a lot of time in senior centers, in nursing homes, um, because I, number one, I help polish off memories because that, that's my superpower. But I also, I get to hear wisdom, you know, that mm-hmm. I didn't have a lot growing up from generations. And I feel like the life we live are the lessons we teach, right? The life we live are the lessons we teach, you know, people around us. And then somebody who's been on this, uh, you know, on this, on this earth longer than me, they have yeah. lessons. And, and it could be lessons of examples or warnings, right? But lessons yeah, either yeah. way. But I also hear these amazing stories, but I also hear when it gets very intimate, some regret creeping in. You know, they talk about, uh, you know, and the regret is always not what they did, but what they didn't do, right? Mm-hmm. And we know that, the regrets of dying. and But some, somehow the regrets I could sum up is they somehow shrunk them their life um, in some way or limited their life because of what other people would think. They didn't pursue that relationship that they were really infatuated with, but, but because of what society would think about yeah. that relationship. Or they pursued a, a career path because it was expected by their parents or some, some, some form of that. And I, I just want to remind people who hear that, that when you're taking your final breaths, it's not a fun conversation because I tend to be more positive, but I'm going to be very practical. When we're taking our final breaths, think just like how I fast forward at the end of my day, you know, I say, what three things happened personally, professionally, if I really said I was happy, you, you deal with your life also. Because when you're taking your final fast forward to the end of your days, at that time where you're taking your final breath, none of other people's opinions, their expectations are going to matter. You know, not, not, none of our fears are going to matter. What's going to matter is how we learned, how we laughed, how we loved, you know, how we lived, right? Yeah. And, I'm, and I just want to remind people, you know, the whole idea of beginning with the end in mind, you know, for, for me, somebody asked me recently, like, you know, because I was... Uh, you know, new, new father. And I was saying like, I want to do this. And people like, you know, you want to make your son proud. Yeah. I want to make my son proud. I want to make, you know, parents proud, all of that, you know, the two, you know, my, my, my wife, my son. But when I think about it, the two people I want to make proud, really that nine-year-old boy that was going through all those challenges, you know, like that was being teased and bullied, called broken. You know, I want to look back. I do these mental experiments all the time. I was like, I want to make that, you know, the the nine-year-old me proud. And then I was to fast forward 99, hopefully, you know, I'd be doing this a long time. I want to make that guy proud also as well, you know? And so, you know, that, 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 that's what I can control, yeah. you know? And I, I just feel like the life we live again are lessons that we teach. And I think we're all on this quest, you know, yeah. to, that, you know, to realize and reveal our, our, our fullest potential. This book, I, I, over 30 years, you know, I had an opportunity to scale my business infomercials and franchises and train the trainer and, you know, like all this kind of media book deals. I never said yes. And in 2019, I got in a car accident. I'll talk about this. And I, um, you created a very safe space. So I just appreciate you. Um, I almost died. And, um, and it made me think about that, put everything in perspective because I never want to be famous, right? I want to help people, but I don't need to be known for it just because I'm very introverted and I'm just, I like to, you know, do things that like that. Um, and that helps me have some kind of harmony, not balance, but harmony, kind of like an orchestra, kind of not everyone has equal amount of everything, but they play music and it's just mm-hmm. your art. Um, but when I had that kind of near death experience, I, I signed the book deal that's been in my inbox for like 10 years you know, um, because I was made me think about what I leave behind. And it really kind of made me think, you know, and you, you might have, you know, have this experience or know people have had that kind of near death experience. Maybe just think of, of legacy, you know, and my next book is, it's, it's different. It wasn't inspired by death. It was experienced by the birth of my son. So now it's, it's inspired by life. And because wow. I want to, I want to, I want to leave the world brighter, you know, for, for, for him. And it's just become very personal for me yeah. in terms of, clarity of mission, building better, brighter brains, no brain left behind, but also depth, you know, of, of purpose. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Jim. And it, it, it is a great book and I can see why it's been so popular and helping so many people. It's really fascinating to hear where it came from, where, where that energy came from. So I, I really do appreciate you sharing that. Just before we finish off talking about building better brains, mm-hmm. um, on a slightly, I guess, lighthearted note, mm-hmm. 
juggling is something I've seen you talk about before. Oh, yeah. You know, why is juggling so good? And then something I, I haven't heard you talk about, but I'm interested because I play with my kids regularly table tennis or ping pong. Mm -hmm. So juggling, yeah. what's the deal? Why is it good? Yeah. Uh, does it matter if we're any good mm -hmm. or not? And yeah, then yeah, yeah. maybe table tennis or ping yeah. pong, is that also good for our brains and why? Yeah. There's, there's a study done here, uh, Oxford University, saying jugglers actually have bigger brains. They create uh, more white matter. I, I believe as your body moves, your brain grooves. I think the, the number one reason we have a brain is to control our movement, mm -hmm. which is interesting to watch. You know, uh, my, my son starting to learn how to crawl and we know that those cross laterals are very important for brain development and, you know, the communication between left and right brain and corpus callosum, that kind of bridging station. So, you know, as you move your body, it challenges different parts of your brain. So it's not just a, a mind-body connection, there's a body-mind connection that even using your opposite hand, you know, will stimulate different parts of your mm. brain. Even when I, I challenge, you know, for people who are just alphas and they're very achievement oriented, try using your finger opposite hand. Like, like speed like, reading. Yeah. Try using your left. If you're, you know, 11% of the popu population is left-handed. But if you're listening to this in your right hand, try using your left hand because potentially what if it could stimulate the right side of your brain? You know, they say that your left side is very, and this is oversimplification. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> logical, but you're right saying more imaginative, creative, but just imagine using your left hand to stimulate different parts or eating and, and it make you more mindful, certainly. Um, in the beginning, it might be difficult because you're focused on doing it right. Because I used to, like if I asked you to write your your name with your opposite hand, it probably won't be so so good. And that's how I see learning also. If I ask everyone to write their first and last name, actually you could do it now, write your first and last name on, on a piece of paper. And then... Um, oh man, with my left hand? No, 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 with your, with your dominant hand. With, with my dominant hand. Yeah. And then when you're done, switch hands and then below it, try below that with your opposite hand, you know, and as you're doing it, oh wow! and I'm challenging to people, you know, that second one, as you're doing it, it takes longer. It um, <laughs> feels weird. Oh, wow. And, um, <laughs> this is, and the quality is probably not as good. So those are the three differences, right? You can just leave it at that. that I, um, I, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I get it. So. But um, so the second time it takes longer, um, the, it was uncomfortable and the quality is not quite as good. And I often feel like when people are trying to learn something, they're trying to, and they're not getting it, even if they're interested in the topic, maybe there's just not, maybe the way you prefer to learn it is different than the, the way the teacher prefers to teach it. And I'm taking my own, hands and kind of passing them there's no connection it's like two ships in the night mm -hmm. and there's no connection because how you learn it is different how it teaches so maybe it's a learning disability or maybe it's a teaching disability or it's just not that communication where you, know, where you have you yeah. know, unification and connected and so maybe you're trying oh here's another way to put it maybe you're trying to learn it with the opposite hand so it takes longer it feels uncomfortable mm -hmm. and the quality, the end result is not quite as good as if you were going to use your dominant hand. And that's what going back to the, the brain quiz, once you know what your strengths are, you could take the judgment out, you know, and you, you're not judging a fish, you know, by its ability to climb a tree, you know, that whole saying, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you could honor your own strengths and know that you could also develop your weaknesses, certainly, because we give you protocols mm -hmm. on how to be more owl or be more uh, cheetah and, and so on. But, um, but going back to the using your opposite hand or something or table tennis, table tennis is wonderful for the brain. I've had multiple matches with, you know, Dr. Daniel Amen. It's his favorite brain training. Really? Yeah. Table tennis. Yeah. Oh, table one. tennis. It's literally what he says is the number one physical activity for the brain. Uh, thinking speed, reaction time, hand-eye coordination. Uh, it's a good cardio if you're doing it well. But um, I, I love table tennis. We, we, me and my son particularly play some pretty <laughs> good, you know, yeah. gains of reaction speed, everything. And yeah. I'm, a, I'm enjoying it. I'm having having a yeah. blast. But B, it's kind of like I I know I've read some what this is good for our brains, and sometimes we'll also play left handed. Yeah. So we're both yeah, right handed yeah, yeah. because I know it feels different. But after a while, you start to groove. Yeah. And, yeah, and get yeah. it. And I'm like, this is good for my brain. I know it is. In fact, there's a um, you know arguably the world's greatest ever snooker player, a chap called Ronnie O'Sullivan. Mm -hmm. Now I don't know if he's like completely right-handed and then he learned this with his weak hand or whether he's ambidextrous I, I couldn't tell you that but he can play almost as good yeah. 
with his left hands. Yeah. And actually when he initially started doing this in composition, some some of his opponents wouldn't shake their ha- shake his hand. They thought he was taking the mickey. They thought he was being unsportsmanlike. Wow. Oh, I can, you know, like the the quip, oh, I can beat, you know, like you might do with your mates when you when you're younger, oh, I can beat you playing with my left hand mates, kind of thing. But actually he's learnt he can play both handed. Yeah. And so on one side of the table, if someone has to use a rest because of just the just the mechanics, he doesn't have to. He just flips to his other hand and yeah. doesn't need to use the rest, which is, is really interesting. Yeah, I love, I, I didn't grow up with a, a ping pong or table tennis uh, in, 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 our, in our home, but uh, it's something that I enjoy now. We have, we have one in our home and, you know, I, I, when people come and they're decent at it, I, I'll play left, I'm right-handed, but I play left-handed. And I've noticed that my left hand is actually getting, in some ways, my slice is better than, not my backhand is better than my forehand, like my, my dominant yeah. hand. Oh. And so, yeah, table tennis, uh, ballroom dancing, uh, juggling, all of that is very stimulating for the brain. The juggling, going back to it, you could watch a video. I'm not, I, I'm, I could juggle, right? But I'm not juggling swords and flaming like ch- chainsaws. But you could watch a YouTube video. What I do, a couple of tips on this though. The reason why I like juggling besides the uh, building better brains is um, it's uh, nice to challenge yourself. It's, you know, getting this end result because I feel like it's a good metaphor for life because how many of us don't feel like we're, we're, we're juggling everything in life, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> but the other part is it forces, it actually helps with your reading, interesting enough, going back to speed reading, because if I'm juggling three balls up in the air, I don't, I have two eyes. I can't look at all three balls with just two eyes, right? So I have to, instead of my foveal vision, like really narrowing, mm. I have to soften my gaze to get more of my uh, perceptual vision, right? Be able to see more, my field of, 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 of focus. And that's the kind of focus, similarly, I noticed when I started teaching juggling, is that I read. Because when you look at a, and I'm opening a book, if you look at this word, liver, right? You look at that word liver, so you have to, there's about 10 words per line, as we mentioned, uh, flush toxin, toxins from the liver. Then there's something called fixations. So this is what keeps people, another thing that keeps people reading slow. When you're doing a fixation, that means a fixation is an eye stop. So if there are 10 words per line, you're fixating on each word, you're making 10 stops. Mm. And it's kind of like if you're driving on a road. Keep pressing the brake. Yeah, it's like doom, boom, boom. It's like or traffic, it's like boom, boom, 10 times. As opposed to if I look at you know the word here and I could see the word to the left and to the right, or, you know, and then so I could soften my gaze with my peripheral vision seat to the left and to the right and maybe see three or four words at a time. Yeah. So then it only takes two, three max fixations to get across the page. So instead of, you know, t- 10 stops, it's less traffic. It's just like one, two, and then I'm done. And I go yeah, can I just say, it's just amazing that you're un packing the art of reading. You know, for, for many of us, we learn how to read at school or from our parents, and then we've never given it any thought. I haven't. I just open a book and read, but yeah. I'm already thinking, I can use my finger now. Yeah. Wow, I'm, I think I'm pretty quick anyway. Let's see what happens when yeah. I start using my finger. And now I'm thinking, yeah. am I, you know, super focused on one or two words, or can I soften everything, yeah. be more relaxed and you know, have that more peripheral vision Two, two yeah. practical things that I can implement yeah. straight away. And then in order to do that, you have to relax, right? So yeah. when I'm juggling like this, I, I open, I expand so I could see this, you know, field of play. So I could, I could take everything in. Same thing when I'm looking at a page, you know, or, or a line. And then so, and also that relaxed state is not putting me in fight or flight, right? Sometimes when we're so narrow focused on something that... Yeah, no, I love it. And so, and then it's, and it's more taxing when you're looking at like, you know, think about your, even just the, the muscles in your eye having to go from da, 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 da. And then sometimes what we're doing is regressing, we're back skipping. Have you ever noticed you reread words or yeah. go to, or reread whole lines? And that takes up a lot of time. And I want to honor what you, what you know, what you, you know, the self-reflection and the awareness that, yeah, reading is a skill. And it could be improved through training. But when's the last time we took a class called reading? We were six. So the difficulty and demand has increased uh, tremendously. But how we actually read something is the same way as we did as a, as a, as a, as a child. Yeah. And, and we haven't upgraded those skills. And that, that's why I think this is so important. I, I'll tell you the big thing in terms of what, and by the way, when you understand your, your peripheral vision, then you don't even have to go across the page. You could indent, you know, a handful of whatever, 
centimeters to the left and to the right and in between. So you didn't even have to go all the way across. You could just stay in the middle and still see what's to what's the left and right. And there's another, save another 25%, right? And this adds up every single day. You're getting that time back. The other thing is the, the thing that's actually challenging the most for readers have you ever noticed when you're reading something, you hear that inner voice inside your head reading along with you? You hear that voice inside your head? Hopefully it's your own voice. It's not like somebody <laughs> else's voice. The reason why it's a challenge is if you have to say all the words inside your mind in order to understand, that means your reading speed is limited to your talking speed, but not your thinking speed. Mm-hmm. Right? The reason why most people read 200 to 250 words per minute is that's the average rate of speech. And can you understand faster? Of course, but you can't talk that fast. So let me ask you the underlining. Like, so we're reevaluating what we learned. Do you need to say words, right? Like uh, computer, New York City, in order to understand what those words are? No. Because no. you've seen them how many times? 100,000 times. Mm-hmm. And they're called sight words. Words that you've seen thousands of times, you know by sight, you don't have to pronounce by sound. And 95% of what we're reading on a regular basis are sight words. Just like when you see traffic signs or a stop sign and it says stop, you don't say stop, but you understand what it means, mm-hmm. right? And so not, that's most of the words. And it, could, could this be one of the reasons why I'm, I don't, I haven't done this enough to, to say this for sure, but I'm not, I think, like sometimes when I try audio books, like mm. I love listening to podcasts, yeah. but I'm not sure I love listening to audiobooks. Yeah. Like I much prefer real books. Yeah. And I wonder if that's because I think I'm a quick reader. Do I maybe find yeah. like the audiobook too slow for the speed that yeah. I like to go at? Could that be a reason? Yeah. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of distinctions. Um, but, but I love podcasts. Yeah. So some people... Like, let's let, let, let's uh, deconstruct this and pack it. So some people will listen to a podcast or an audiobook at faster speed, right? They'll do it at 1.5 or, or 2. They might be doing it right now, right? Because you can't, no one can speak that fast, but we can understand that fast, mm. right? And that's just another evidence that we could be reading faster than we currently are. Yeah. You know, when people are mostly reading, they're reading one word at a uh, time. And I'll tell you, if you get distracted while you read, which is a lot of people, it's because you're reading too slow. Yeah. Let me let me say that again. Most people think they get distracted because they're not an interested topic, and that could be a contributing factor. But most people get distracted because they're reading too slow. Because your brain is this incredible supercomputer, and when you're reading, you're feeding this supercomputer mm. one word at a time. Metaphorically, you're starving your mind, and if you don't give your brain the entertainment it needs, it'll seek st- stimulus elsewhere wow. in the form of distraction. So you start thinking about other stuff. I love that. Right? It makes total yeah, sense. It's like if you're driving. If you're driving down, uh, down, you know, your your wonderful neighborhood here, you're not really focused on driving, right? But if you're racing a car at, you know, you know, F one and you. Are you, are you th- like, if you're driving slow, you can think about the dry cleaning, about, about what you should have said on the podcast. Be thinking <laughs> yeah. about five, you could be drinking coffee, texting. You'd be five <laughs> different things when you're going slow because you're, you could be that. But if you're going fast, are you, th- are you thinking about, are you trying to text? Are you, are you trying to drink coffee? Are you thinking about yeah. the dry cleaning? No, because the speed gives you the focus and the focus gives you the comprehension. So most people think if I read any faster, I won't understand it. Actually, because we test, we have more data than anybody. We have the, you know, the, our flagship speed reading program has been around for a long time. We actually find that the people who are reading faster actually have better comprehension in general because they have better focus. Because when they're going faster, there's no time to be distracted and thinking about other things and mm. trying to get, some people read so slowly they fall asleep because they're just bored. Yeah, you know, and then they're multitasking and everything because they're not giving their brain the stimulus wow. it needs, so it entertains itself in other ways. So there's a big science and art to this. Like in the training that we do, we show people because I can't. And there's no quick tip for it on how to reduce the subvocalization. So you're not saying you're only saying the words that are new to you, right? And you know the words you have to pronounce mm. because you have, you know, they're not familiar to you, and so and then we teach all the different ways to take notes and to study and underline, do all the fancy stuff. But the idea here is, you know, prioritize reading because 
leaders are readers. You read to succeed. Reading is your mind would exercise your body. That's the whole mindset part. And give yourself a real purpose to read. Don't just read randomly. Like you read for purpose because you want to implement it. How can I use this? Why must I use this? When will I use this? And then the method, upgrade your reading of skills and abilities because it's just like seven habits of highly effective people, right? The, you know, by Stephen Covey, the seventh habit, sharpen the saw. If you have all this wood you need to cut and you have a blade, you know, that's, that's dull, when do you want to sharpen it? At the end, in the middle, the beginning. In the beginning. Because if you wait to the end, you just struggled a lot. You wasted a lot of time. You suffered. You stressed. And when you sharpen the saw, like this, Limitless, will help you read every other book. This is like, like you know, Lord of the Rings, like the one ring that controls mm-hmm. them all. Limitless is like the one book that will help you learn, read, and remember them all. (laughs) You go through this and then everything after that, you sharpen the saw and it's just a whole lot easier. Jim, I could talk to you for hours. There's there's so much wisdom about memory, learning, focus, attention that we haven't even got into. Of course, you've got all your online courses, you've got your Limitless book, you've got your own podcast. So there's plenty of resources that people can go to to learn more. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Um, as you know, this podcast is called Feel Better, Live More. When we feel yeah. better in ourselves, we get more out of our life. Your whole mission is to help us have better brains, better functioning brains, which is going to help work, relationships, hobbies, whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. So right at the end of this conversation, I wonder if you could leave my audience with some wisdom, some insights, some sort of practical tips. If they feel inspired by what they've heard, what can they do right now Mm -hmm. to start improving how their brains function? Yeah. Okay. So I would say within the next hour or definitely the next day, put something in action, right? The knowledge is not only power, you know, it, it could be profit if it's utilized. And I don't mean just financial profit. Certainly the faster you can learn, the faster you can earn. Most people listening to this it's not like 100 years ago. You're not compensated for your muscle power like it was back then. It's your mind power. It's not your brute strength. It's your brain strength. So I would say prioritize your ability to learn how to learn. If there was a genie could grant you any one wish, you would ask for, well, limitless wishes. But if, uh, let's say I was your learning genie, I could help you become an expert in any one subject or any one skill. Yes, you could pick ping pong, you know, or you could think, or you could think about neuroscience. But if you could say like, hey, I want to be excellent at learning how to learn, every area gets easier. Medicine, money, martial arts, music, Mandarin, everything gets easier. So I'd say the first thing is prioritize learning how to learn, whether it's reading better, improving your memory focus. These are not things that you have. These are things that you could do. And genius leaves clues, right? So you can learn how to learn, right? Whether it's through us or just finding it online, learn how to learn. The second thing I would say is just read more. That That's kind of obvious, but I'm just reiterating what we've talked about here. Leaders are readers. Just even if it's just 10 minutes a day, make it super easy. You know, I carry a book with you. And when you have downtime, I do so much of my reading just like when I feel like time opens up. You know, meeting starts 15 minutes late and that 15 minutes adds up. So I just like picking up a book or if I'm waiting online at the DMV or something like that is to read more. Um, third thing, think about your dominant question. I'm talking about things that, you know, we've gone over because it's a rapid review. Think about what your dominant questions are because you change your questions, you change your life. You know, maybe your question is, how do I make this moment even ma- magical? What's the best use of this moment? Mm-hmm. What's most important to me in the, you know, you know, right now? You know, or, or how can I make that nine-year-old, you know, version of me proud? You know, whatever your focus goes, that's where the energy is definitely going to flow. And, um, and then the, the, the last two things I would say, um, take the quiz. A small, simple step you could do is post your quiz result and tag us both so yeah. we get to see what you are and share one thing you're going to do for a better brain. Like share what animal you are, get a nice, uh, we created these AI animals, uh, personalized. <laughs> you could post it online, tag us both. I'll actually gift out three copies of Unlimitless, just the three random people who do oh, that. Amazing. So it's a small, simple step you could take to really show your your fans, your, your, your followers, your friends, your family, you know, like something new about you. Um, and then, well, because you tag us, I'll get to see it and I'll repost some of, some of those. Um, and then the last thing is teach it. You know, my, my philosophy on life is you learn to earn to return. You learn so you can earn, so you have more to be able to return. And I think one of the best ways of returning something is to teach it to somebody else. You take advantage of something called the explanation effect. 
the explanation effect is exactly what it sounds like. If you learn with the intention of explaining to somebody else, you're going to learn it easier and better. You're going to own it because you're not going to use, when you sum up what you learned here, and that's active retrieval, that's another practice you could use. You're not going to use necessarily my words, you know, our words to explain it. You're going to use your own words and then you're going to have that ownership. And I think that's the most beautiful Mm. thing, right? If you you gave me a certain amount of currency, I give you the same amount of currency, nothing happens. It's the same thing, right? But if I share a new idea with you and you share a new idea, that's why your community is so amazing. And I'm a big fan of, of your show and your YouTube, I subscribe to, you know, it, it always shows up early and even on social media, also on Instagram. But then I share a new idea with you and you share a new idea with me. All of a sudden we have two brand new ideas. Yeah. And all I just ask is that you don't keep it an idea. You turn it into some kind of implementation because that, that's the ultimate thing is the integration. You know, when your, when your mindset, your motivation and the methods, when your head, your heart and your hands are all aligned, then you're limit, living a limitless life. You know, I, I, and I truly believe there's a version, if you're still listening to this, I promise you, I'm talking to the person listening to this right now, there's a version of yourself that's patiently waiting. And the goal is you show up every single day until you're introduced. Jim, love everything you're doing. Love the impact you're making on the world. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. If you enjoyed that conversation, I think you are really going to enjoy this one, all about the simple morning habit that you can use to transform your life. So many people get stopped by procrastination. You know what you need to do. The issue is how do you make yourself take actions? 